Uh, hi, Martin, how are you? All right, uh, hi, Islam. I was getting worried here. I, I, the 1730 and there was no one, so maybe people are still busy trying to wrap up things at work or something. Oh, yeah. Y yes, Doc. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Um, fine, fine, fine. Yeah, so we'll just uh, maybe wait for some five minutes or so until okay, we have okay. a lot more people and then we'll start. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, so in case you've just joined us, uh, like uh, Derek and uh, Makonde, we we are going to wait until 17.35 to see if the others are going to join us. Uh, so we are starting at 17.35. I cannot, are you able to get me, Doc? Yes, loud and clear. Uh, thank you, Derek. We had the problems the on last time. Mm -hmm. You got a new microphone or something? No, I'm um, just switched the lab today. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll be on mute for now. Okay. I mean, so if, if just in case people have any random questions, maybe, uh, and, and I know, I mean, all we looked at last week was mostly administrative, but as we were waiting for the others, uh, if, if people have random questions about the course, uh, being structured and assessments, I mean, we can use this time to maybe have a discussion about that. Maybe.
All right. Uh, I know I said uh, 1735, but I think we we can start now. Uh, they'll probably find us. All right. So today's uh, I just shared my screen, and I do hope uh, people can can see here. Um, <clears throat> so I, th I thought today we would uh, try and uh, help contextualize what we're going to be doing, and also a brief introduction to uh, to the things that we are going to be covering. And what we've discovered in the past is that this is um, this is best done by trying to showcase some examples of what's currently going on. And, and I think most of us are probably uh, are aware of certain, certain things, certain examples that are, that are going to be highlighted. Um, but we also try to focus on uh, examples that are specific to, to the department. So past projects that have been, have been done by postgraduate students that are to a certain extent uh, data mining centric in nature. Um, and then I all, also always like uh, uh, trying to contextualize some of these examples from the perspective of Zambia. So I, 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 I have a few slides that are dedicated to, to what I feel are opportunities that, that are available in Zambia right now. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd really appreciate it if as we are discussing, as we're discussing these things, maybe we can, we can also have a back and forth. Uh, maybe we can share experiences of perhaps things that work that that um, that could potentially um, be open ground uh, for potential data mining solutions to be devised for those problems. I don't know. So hopefully today we we get to finalize part two, three, and four. So after we we are done contextualizing contextualizing things, I, I talk a bit about some. Some, some things that we need to be aware of um, at UNSA, right? Uh, and I, I always like uh, <clears throat> mentioning that one of the most, perhaps one of the most important lessons I picked up from my, uh, my, uh, <clears throat> sorry about that. Uh, someone was trying to call me, just muted my phone. One of the things I, I one of the most important lessons I picked up from, from um, one of my, PhD supervisor, in fact, was my master's supervisor, was this idea that um, a university education is mostly about the experience, right? So it, it turns out that uh, uh, the way we learn things, you probably the most you will learn or pick up is the interaction with uh, other postgraduate students and uh, I guess getting access to some of these support structures. So I'll talk more about uh, some random activities. I think that you've probably seen some of these things have been uh, spamming the mailing list with uh, with uh, masters and, and and PhD um, or exams, you have was uh, they call them. Uh, it's always nice to attend these events so that you can anticipate what's coming once you are done with your dissertation. But but also I've discovered myself that I I get to identify potential problems that that uh, exist in these other domains when when I interact with people from. From, uh, from other disciplines. Um, and then we, we get to just quickly go through this part that's tagged as uh, how to read a paper because it turns out that uh, one of the key assessments, the paper summarization aspect, will require that we understand exactly how to, um, how to analyze an academic piece of writing, so a peer-reviewed paper. And I know for most of us, it's probably going to be revision. That is fine. Uh, but so I thought, I thought we'd do that. Uh, so I'm just going to ask just to confirm if you can still hear me. And if you can see the screen, I hope. Uh, oh, we can hear you, Dr. Oh, thank, all right, thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it would be nice if we could have it back and forth as well. And to, uh, yeah. So maybe we'll try and start with some everyday examples here, right? And. Um, I decided to include this. I don't know if I had this last last year. Or I just included it here. It, it turns out that this motivation for data mining and warehousing stems from the fact that I think now more than ever, I mean, the amount of of, of data that we're generating is just uh, it's unprecedented, right? It's ever at the personal level and um, and industrial scale as well. Right? Uh, I, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm part of uh, <laughs> I'm part of uh, a ton of WhatsApp groups, right? And keeping up sometimes with those WhatsApp groups, especially these groups with uh, uh, 200 plus or maybe even close to 500 people, 
is um, it can be draining. Um, so as an example, I'm, I'm, I'm part of I'm part of this uh, WhatsApp group where you have all the Unzasu members, right, at Unza. Uh, just to give you some context here, Unza has uh, almost 900. Last time I checked, it was 754, but it's slightly more faculty staff, right? So these are um, people that are part of, uh, for the most part, part of the Zalaru. Now imagine a situation where you have, uh, I think we have almost, uh, is it almost half that number, part of this WhatsApp group. And I've actually muted that group because I can't keep up with the amount of information that comes there. Especially that there are people that are selling things there, people that are sharing memes and all this fun. But the, the key thing here is that uh, the amount of data that we're generating is just, it's, it's increased, right? There's massive amounts of data that being, that's being generated. And, and we'll look at some, some sure other examples here. But also, I, I, I always like lumping in, um, besides that motivation, lumping in some specific examples here. Really interesting article there. If you just Google up the thing on the BBC, um, you notice that people are doing a lot of interesting things, right? Uh, so uh, currently, I mean, you have certain AI, um, AI uh, techniques or approaches that are able to outperform doctors. Right? Now, that's, that's not to say that uh, the plan is to replace doctors with AIs, right? right? But who knows, maybe in the future or something. Uh, we already have driverless cars. Um, all to do with data, right? <clears throat> if, you, if you look at this photo, by the way, I mean, think of what happens at uh, a, a referral hospital like UTH, for instance. And by the way, there's a confirmed partic participation by way of a speaker from UTH, a person we had last year who's coming back. And, and I talk more about some of the things we are thinking of doing with them, right? The amount of, of imagery that they generate, a lot of it, right? Um, X-rays, chest X-rays. You, you now have that uh, cancer disease hospital where you have so much going on. Right? And the question to ask is, how is, how is that massive um, amount of data being used, right? How are they analyzing that data? It turns out that UTH mostly takes advantage of manual process anyway. Um, um, something closer to home here, and now I, there's a group I'm a part of on, on, on Facebook, it's a Chichewa Chilimkamo, something I don't know if you understand Chewa here, it's a little translation for Chewa language is in the mouth or something, it's on the tongue or something. And what I like about what typically happens on Facebook is there's this um, automatic translation of certain languages, right? Now, <laughs> if you look at this, this thing here, right? Uh, now, I don't know how many of you understand Chewa here, but Kamalidiesa certainly does not translate, so I'm, uh, I am not going to be able to do it. If you notice, the, the top part here, I don't know if you can see the translation here, but the, uh, if I can just review this, but this is what this person posted, right? And um, the translation, right, is, the, is this part here. Um, so anyway, another application, right, of uh, so massive amounts of data being generated. I mean, Facebook has millions and millions of users, right? Uh, different languages being used here. Um, classic example is a machine translation that takes place there. Uh, now, I've, I've had conversations with, uh, with, with past cohorts and uh, tried to throw in certain things at them. And, and in fact, last year we invited uh, a, a colleague of mine, uh, he was about two years behind me, also doing his PhD, and um, it turns out that uh, the lab that he's associated with uh, tends to do, or they work a lot with languages, so-called under-resourced languages, so languages that are not properly represented online. Right? And it turns out that's part of the reason why this translation is not accurate. Right? Um, for you to, to come up with an accurate translation of a language like Chewa, for instance, in this case, or Bemba, or Silozi, or Ishtonga, doesn't matter, you need data, right? A lot, lots and lots of data. Of course, data coupled with different types of techniques that are used to automatically translate languages from one language to the other. Um, so just to showcase here that uh, one, one approach is to try and crowdsource, crowdsource uh, what's happening here. And the crowdsourcing implicitly is building, I guess, what you might call uh, labels, right? So things that you can use to to train whatever language model is used to perform this translation. Um, in this case, uh, and I did not rate this as a two out of a scale of five here. It was actually supposed to be less than one, right? This is wrong. This is very, very wrong. Um, 
but it gets gets even better. I mean, if you look at uh, platforms like YouTube, right? Um, can't quite can't quite remember the statistics, but uh, there there are thousands, I think, almost thousands and thousands of YouTube videos that are uploaded at any given point in time. So the the entry barrier has been drastically reduced, right? It's not like you pay anything to upload uh, stuff on YouTube, right? Um, so a lot of potential there, and and in fact, companies like like Google, YouTube in this case, subsidiary of Google, it turns out that they take advantage of some of the techniques we're going to be discussing in the course. And uh, some classic examples would be just how they, when you're uploading a video on YouTube, right? One of the things you need to do is you need to associate a thumbnail to the video. Um, it turns out that uh, a couple of, I don't know if it's years now, is it last year or before last year, they devise an automated way of trying to generate thumbnails. So the idea is you can, um, you look at uh, a video that has length X, and then you splice out the uh, the frames, right? So a video is made up of frames, obviously, we know this. So you split up the frames, and then you, you try to use machine learning to try and identify the appropriate frames to to add to a list of candidate um, candidate thumbnails, right? Um, currently, they, they give you an option of three, so they automatically generate three, and then you're given an option to upload one yourself. It's, it's pretty decent, actually. There's, there's, a, um, there's a paper, uh, well, there's a blog post written about this, probably a paper as well. Uh, so it's just uh, YouTube. Uh, um, <clears throat> I hope this thing is going to lead me to, this is probably one of, one of it, one of the things here, but I'm, I was looking for an actual blog post from Google or something, I don't know. This affiliation is, uh, nah. Um, you might want to look up uh, this, I guess this will give you an idea of uh, where else to go next if you're interested in this. Um, but again, I mean, the, the in, in, in all of these things that I've just, talked about and the things that we're going to look at next is everyday examples, what you notice is that there's, there's a golden thread, right? This idea that you need uh, data for you to take advantage of uh, uh, machine learning, right? Um, it gets even better, I mean, uh, with the massive amounts of information that is being uh, generated on platforms like, uh, social media platforms like Instagram, like, uh, 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 Twitter and, and, and Facebook, what you realize is that uh, sometimes people tend to um, to upload things that are, um, are in bad taste. Um, and so there are ways, right? There are ways in which you can, you can automatically detect certain characteristics of say, data such as images, for instance. In this case, I think this was one of those gory images where uh, you have blood, right? I don't know if this person died or something, but um, um, you can um, create models that are able to automatically detect those patterns. Right? Um, and then in terms, of, in terms of what's been going on at UNSA, um, I haven't had time to find out if uh, we have uh, past, uh, past projects from last year um, that are data mining centric in nature, but, but uh, just to list a few here, so Lillian worked, uh, she, she was graduating, I think, in 2019. So she worked on a project that was aimed at uh, trying to automatically predict weather, right? Rainfall patterns, essentially. Um, it turns out that the Zambia Meteorological Department currently uses a manual-like process. And so she was trying to see if she could, she would come up with an automated way of, of predicting weather patterns. Um, I'm not sure how far they've gone by way of trying to extend uh, this project. Because remember, most, most of the things that are done uh, 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 at academic institutions will typically end up uh, being shelved or something. It's really the case that they, they, they get to go into production. Um, and then there's someone, uh, there's some, there's um, Louisa who was working on uh, trying to automatically um, come up with uh, uh, customer segments for effective tar targeted campaigns. Uh, for those of you that have worked in the uh, telecommunications sector, for instance, you notice that um, one of the main obsession of, uh, of these uh, mobile tele telecommunications companies um, is to try and uh, create so-called targeted campaigns so that they, 
they make a uh, maximum possible amount of profit. And so you get an SMS and they'll tell you, there's this uh, bundle that's being offered to you at a much cheaper price. Right? You're being targeted because you exhibit certain characteristics. Um, it was interesting listening to him give his talk because um, I happen to have worked in the telecom sector and, and uh, to a certain extent I understand this field. And so uh, in case you're wondering, interesting uh, data attributes or features that were used um, uh, from uh, details that you find in your uh, KYC, the so-called, uh, is it know your client or customer database? Um, so to try and see if you can, you can, you can associate things like the date of birth of somebody, their age to, to how, to what sort of services would mostly be attracted to it, right? And, and you can make certain assumptions if you look at this field. So assumptions like if someone is below a certain age, they are more likely to be browsing the internet late at night. So what you'd want to do is to provide them with an incentive so that they're, they're able to make use of the network late at night when it's less busy or something. Um, Friday, I uh, worked on a project that's more aligned towards automatic number plate recognition. Not much to do with uh, machine learning per se, it was more to do with uh, optical character recognition. Um, but it turns out that uh, there, there's certain aspects of this work that could have been carved out as part of the data mining slash machine learning or AI uh, problem. Um, and then people like uh, Francis and Simon here were working towards trying to see if they could automatically detect uh, four armyworms. Um, so we know, I mean, for those of you that are farmers, I think most people know about this. We, we usually have, um, we have this problem with four armyworms, right? And so, uh, as part of the much larger project, what these guys were trying to work towards is to see, right, if we can detect these four armyworms early on before they start ravaging these crops, so that you can you can come up with uh, uh, interventions uh, that can prevent their spread. Right? Uh, interesting project. Um, again, I'm not really sure if uh, there are plans to take this to production, especially that I think they had funding to. Uh, it must have been food agriculture organization or something. I could be wrong here, but 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 part, as part of a much larger project, uh, people from biology were working on different aspects of of this this problem to do with four armyworms. Um, and then uh, Knox, who I, I believe is graduating this year, uh, I don't know if he's already graduated, but he was defending last year. Um, he was trying to take advantage of data mining techniques to detect potential fraud in large scale data that is available in the banking sector. It turns out that he works, or at least at the time he used to work for NatSafe, and so um, he was able to identify a problem there. Uh, so a lot of interesting things here um, that have been happening in the department. Um, I do believe uh, Dr. Peter, I could be wrong here, but Dr. Peter, I believe is trying to work towards uh, projects that are centered around trying to uh, use sensors or sensor data or something to detect levels of pollution or something, I don't know, crazy things being done. Um, please feel free if uh, you have any questions uh, as we are just walking through these projects. Uh, if not, just to check if it's still online, okay. <clears throat> right, I mean, so, um, so I thought I'll just briefly talk about, now briefly talk about some, some of the ongoing things that I, I'm either doing or they're in the pipeline. Um, I'll, I'll start with this. Um, somebody wants to come in. I'll, I'll start with this uh, larger project that we've been working towards uh, since early 2018, actually, right? Uh, so the problem we're trying to address here is one to do with uh, square research output. So if you look at the the visibility of uh, research output that's generated in, in, in Zambia, uh, so by entities like the UNSA, CBU, Mungushi University, Lusaka University, and, and you try and compare, compare us with, with, uh, with the rest of the world, what you notice is that uh, the representation of square research output is quite low, right? Um, so the online uh, availability of such content is quite low. And so, so we've been trying to figure out ways in which we could probably try and address this problem. Um, it turns out that some of the things we've been doing uh, have to do with uh, data mining and uh, application of certain machine learning techniques. Um, so for instance, we've, uh, we've come up with models, right? Models that are able to um, 
to automatically classify certain types of digital objects. And the beauty with that is if you can automatically classify these things, um, then you can come up with automated ways of trying to make them available online. Right? Uh, and in fact, as part of this project, uh, uh, I'm working with a master's student who's almost finalizing his work. Maybe we invite him to give a talk here this year. Um, so what he's working towards is to try and see if you can automatically classify institutional repository objects, essentially, right? Uh, classic supervised machine learning uh, techniques are being used here. Uh, so binary a combination of binary classification, uh, multi-class classification, and multi-label classification as well. Uh, these are all things that we're going to be uh, discussing. Something else we've been thinking about here as part of this project is to try and see if we can automatically generate uh, content, right? Because it turns out that part of the reason why we have low representation online, especially if you look at it from the perspective of um, uh, content that is supposed to be made available in institution-owned platforms such as IRs. Now, in case you're wondering what an IR is, an institution repository is, is a, a typical platform that um, uh, an institution will use to make available research, uh, research output. So I'm just pasting in the, in the chat box here uh, uh, a link to the UNSA institution repository. If you look at the UNSA institution repository, it's used to archive things like uh, uh, dissertations that are generated by students, right? Carefully curated by by school, in the case of UNSA, if you notice here. So these are all uh, dissertations that have been authored uh, per school. Um, so we can go to School of Natural Sciences, for instance. We have dissertations that have been authored from Department of Chemistry, Department of Computer Science, um, Geography, and all those departments that are part of NS. You can actually see that uh, as you're scrolling through here, you find that there's content coming in from the University of Zambia, I hope. Uh, but anyway. Uh, so we're trying to see if we can automatically generate uh, content and specifically so-called um, meta information or metadata, right? So information that is used to describe these things that are archived in such platforms. So if a student, a student's dissertation is uploaded here, usually it's, uh, there we go, Simkanga uh, Alinani from computer science here. Um, so a student will produce uh, a dissertation, right? Like Alinani did here. Once this is produced, for it to end up in, in this platform here, somebody has to prepare this meta information or the metadata, the abstract, the title, the subjects. They have to identify which collections and sub collections this thing is supposed to be associated with. And it turns out that the auxiliary information that you tag this information with is quite a lot, actually. Some of it is not even added here because. Uh, the entities at UNSA that are responsible for doing this um, uh, don't have sufficient manpower, right? So the argument here is that we can take advantage of certain machine learning techniques and automatically generate this information so that we don't have people manually trying to identify what subject categories should be associated with this dissertation. I could automatically generate that content. Um, uh, I was as part of um, I was part of a team that was working towards so beginning twenty was it twenty twenty or twenty nineteen forgetting now we started working towards uh, trying to devise a plan to 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 come up with um, annual uh, research reports for the University of Zambia. It turns out that this hasn't been done for quite some time now. Now the challenge that was there, right, is that uh, because of the non availability or the low visibility of research output online, it was difficult for us to compile um, statistics related to uh, the related to publications that are authored by faculty staff and students at UNSA, right? Um, but looking at this problem, looking at some of the things we've, we, we've been up to here, you soon realize that uh, this can be carved out into a classic data mining project where we can automate most of these things here. Um, so you automate the harvesting of information from the different platforms where um, researchers at UNSA will tend to archive information from the institutional repository to, uh, it turns out that UNSA just doesn't archive uh, content on the institutional repositories. There are a number of, uh, of journals at UNSA. You probably want to be on the lookout 
for this space here. Uh, the number of journals at UNSA where um, where this this content is is um, is deposited, right? So uh, there's this platform called the uh, University of Zambia Journals. It's an OJS platform essentially. Uh, it's used to um, electronically make available different issues associated with the journals that are linked to the University of Zambia, right? Uh, interesting stuff happening at UNSA, in case you didn't know. All right, so, so we can mine information and try and make sense out of this information. Yeah, we, we to give you an idea of uh, some of the things we are doing, we were manually, uh, uh, not manually, of course, there's certain things we automated, like when we were trying to extract content from platforms such as Google Scholar, for instance. We had to de devise uh, manual queries to, to get that content. Uh, what makes this especially hard is that Google Scholar doesn't have uh, an API, right? So uh, there was a lot of uh, scraping that was involved. And, and, and interesting things here that can be, can be identified as potential problem, problems here is uh, identifying, right? Uh, specific publications that are linked to, to the actual individuals associated with UNSA. Ambiguity in names, right? If we look at if you if we look at your names, for instance, here, I'll bet you there's probably another Francis uh, Kawesha somewhere out there, right? Maybe at CPU. Um, so the question would be, how can we automatically try and set uh, Francis Kawesha apart from another Francis Kawesha who is available somewhere out there, right? Um, you can identify features here that can help you with that. Um, something that I obsess about because of the many years I spent exploring the um, uh, technology enhanced learning space, it turns out that my PhD was uh, in, in a subfield of technology enhanced learning called uh, orchestration of learning. Uh, although my focus was more on trying to figure out uh, how we can design and develop uh, software tools um, that can can be used to effectively orchestrate teaching and learning resources in formal learning spaces, essentially. But in the process, I guess I got to understand the education sector. Um, and so part, part of what uh, I'm personally busy up to here is uh, I've noticed that there are certain undergraduate courses that I've been coordinating, especially this first year course, it's a computer architecture course. The failure rate is very high. Um, there's a problem with that. And one problem is there's a lot of resources that are being directed to this course. Almost 90% of the students are funded by the government, right? So the program that's associated with this course is uh, uh, it's to do with uh, uh, ICTs with education. So essentially, people are being trained that are eventually going to teach in high schools uh, uh, and poss possibly colleges to, to teach IT courses. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but... Uh, I think junior high school and high school now has introduced computer studies, right? But there's, there's uh, very few people that are able to teach those courses. But anyway, so, so the problem is, uh, can we, how can we address this issue of uh, high failure rates in this course, right? A year long course, um, those of you that have done, most of you have done computer science here, you realize that computer architecture is probably one of the uh, uh, courses that students tend to struggle with. It turns out that there's a, computer systems and computer architecture component associated with the course. And so the thinking, right, is um, we're thinking, can we automatically predict students that are more likely to fail this course early on so that we introduce targeted interventions to prevent them from failing? It turns out there's nothing new here, right? This, this has been done. I guess what sets us apart here, what sets what we're doing apart with what has been done before is uh, the sort of features that we're trying to take advantage of, right? Uh, and, and I get to, to discuss this particular project in depth, uh, it along with some of, some of these uh, document classification uh, projects we've been working towards um, in lecture series number three, I think. Um, but to give you an idea here, we are working with uh, features such as demographic details of students, right? So we look at things like, uh, uh, are we able to, to uh, identify colorations that exist between somebody's demographic details, like their age and, sorry for, for, for saying this, but maybe their gender as well, very controversial, I know sometimes, right? 
uh, can we can we can we identify these specific demographic features uh, and be able to link them to the outcome right the students background right uh, which school they went to whether they did computer studies or not you know their motivation for doing this course were they coerced or forced to do this course or did they actually want to do this course um, and then also we we also look at um, other features like uh, performance in these uh, assessments that are done early on, like quizzes. So can we uh, identify a correlation or a link between the performance in certain quizzes or certain topics with the final output, right? So interesting things here, there, there are a whole bunch of other crazy uh, features that we are working with, like for instance, in this image, we, we get dumps, right? Dumps of uh, uh, signals from the learning management system. So can we, can we, can we link uh, the rate at which a student accesses the, uh, the learning management site for the course with the outcome? And the thinking here is for a student that regularly checks what's going on uh, in the course by logging into the LMS, perhaps we can assume or hypothesize that that student is more likely to perform better because they're engaging with the course. Right. And it turns out that if you look at an LMS like Moodle, for instance, there's there's a whole bunch of uh, there's a whole bunch of signals that you can pick from the Moodle, right? Uh, from from just uh, uh, I get I, I guess the hits, so the the, the frequency associated with uh, with with how often this student accesses the Moodle site, down to specifics of uh, specific features of Moodle, right? So uh, which students are accessing the notes? Are they downloading the notes? Are they consuming the videos? And can we link all those different signals with the, with the outcome, right? Again, um, to mention here that all of these things are linked to, and if I can look at a specific activity here, I haven't checked the logs in a while, but if I can look at the most recent uh, notes, for instance, make a series number five and look at uh, all participants, and uh, let's see how many people viewed the resource. Right, so you notice that if you look at the, the logs that you get back, right, they are so nuanced. They are linked to each particular individual who is um, um, each particular individual who is uh, associated with the course. And it takes a bit of time here, by the way, because um, uh, there's quite a lot of the, the way the Moodle is configured at Unza is that you you have the same site uh, that is used every year or something. We'll get back to this later on. But anyway, key thing here is uh, we're trying to use data mining to try and see if we can predict outcomes. And, and this is, this is a, a classic, uh, I guess you could look at this as binary classification. Is this student at risk or not, right? Um, or you can look at it as being a multi-class uh, classification problem where you, you have some sort of scale that gives you uh, a range tied to this risk, right? Is he uh, um, strongly at risk or something? Or, I mean, you can use a scale or something, five point scale, uh, in which case it doesn't become a binary classification problem. It's still taking a bit of time here. But the logs will, it's not like they appear like this. This is after post harvesting here. So, anyway, LMS, log mining. Um, and then, Beginning is it last year or before last year, I, I became obsessed with, uh, for those of you that have uh, children at home, I'm sure you've bought them the so-called Mao tablet, right? Um, uh, we, while the projects that we've been working towards here uh, don't necessarily have much to do with data mining, except for the part where we're doing some analysis with the logs that are generated here. This is running Android. We know that there's a whole bunch of logs that are generated by the Android OS here, so we can take advantage of, we can mine that data and try and make sense out of it. Um, interesting things that you can do is maybe you can, you can try and uh, create uh, some application that takes into account logs that are being generated as a student or as a pupil using these tablets to guide them accordingly, right? Point them in the right direction on which sort of content they should be consuming or which uh, areas they should focus more on. And because there are pupils here, obviously, this would be mostly used by parents in the case of the home edition, or the more home edition, or the teacher 
in the case of the, uh, the school edition. Uh, this thing is still not coming up, that's fine. Um, I don't know if people have heard of the Moao tablet. Anyone uh, who, has, uh, who has one at home for their kid or child or something? Or anyone who has heard of the Moao tablet? No, okay. Uh, I'm just going to check if I'm still, I'm still online, right? Still following through? You can still hear me, I hope. We are able to get you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, again, I found myself talking to myself. Uh, so <clears throat> I'll regularly check to see if I'm talking to myself because I'm offline. Hopefully you'll be able to send a WhatsApp message here. Um, then we'll check that, uh, we'll get a notification that that, um, that is an issue. All right, uh, so, so a lot there, right? Um, a while back, this, this project has, um, it's come to a halt because uh, access to data has become problematic. But I was working with uh, two economists. Uh, so there's a person who, is, uh, who has a background in public health, but he's an economist, obviously. Um, and also another colleague who is based at, uh, at the University of Cape Town. And what we're trying to do is to try and try and figure out if, um, if the so-called farm input supply program uh, is effective, right? So the smart people with the economics background came up with what they were calling or what they're terming the triple effect method. Um, but it turns out that, that we, we are heavily reliant on data, right? A broad spectrum of data here. A missing ingredient is information we needed or we need from uh, Central Statistic Office, and I know they rebranded to uh, Zambia Statistical Agency or something. Um, but yeah, a lot of data mining taking place here. Survey data, um, uh, details to do with uh, special, uh, special information that CSO generates. Uh, so information like, uh, I don't know if people have worked with shape files here. Um, specific locations of um, uh, regions in Zambia, like constituencies, right? wards and, and districts and provinces, right? Um, so a lot of mining there. Um, so as part of my PhD, uh, part of what I did was I was doing a segmentation analysis. Um, so trying to, uh, to try and uh, make sense out of uh, video data. Um, and I'm, I'm planning to take this forward because in, in as much as UNSA currently doesn't have a lecture recording infrastructure, um, but I've been experimenting with uh, recording screencasts. In fact, even way before the, the, the advent of COVID-19, what I would do is uh, every time I had class, I would uh, record a screencast of that class and, and the audio as well, and then uh, make it available. And the idea is uh, if, if we can, if we can uh, collect a lot of data and label it, we can, we can do a lot of interesting things. Uh, I know one of the complaints that normally comes through from students, uh, especially undergrads, is the lectures are too long uh, and I always tell them, but you're supposed to crowd, crowd, you're supposed to take advantage of crowdsourcing and uh, create those timelines in YouTube. But the question is, can we not automatically uh, create those, those timelines, right? I'm sure people have done this before, I haven't looked into this. Those are some of the crazy things we're thinking of doing here. Um, something that other people have done here to do with mining data that's specific to videos is uh, uh, searching through video, right? So you do a, a speech to text, um, a speech to text conversion, and then you're searching through the text. Uh, there are tools that are available these days that, that are, um, are quite effective, to be honest, right? Uh, except um, you, you, for you to, to do it on, on someone who has a so-called Zambian accent, you, 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 you'd need a lot of data of people uh, from Zambia. That's, it, it turns out you discover that this thing they're calling data mining and warehousing is sent around data mostly. The problem is always with the data. The techniques, I mean, this is where you come in, right? Understanding how these things work is a trivial process. Um, but, but, but the data part is, it turns out is what, uh, um, what's the difficult part. Uh, we had someone, we had people from uh, the telecom sector, was it last year or the year before? And I was telling them to say, um, these call center uh, logs that, these call center queries that are logged, 
what do these talk, tel telecom organizations do with, what, what do they do with this data, right? Maybe we can take advantage of such data and build interesting things, right? And I'm sure the telecommunications, telecommunications sector has certain problems associated with um, the, the call center uh, voice calls that are recorded. I mean, how, how do they, I, I don't know if there's someone who has a, a background in telecommunications and worked with the call center, but the question I might have is, uh, if, if you have a whole bunch of call center agents here, how are you able to tell that someone is effective? If this is a person that perhaps uh, answers uh, 100 calls, hypothetically speaking, per day, how do you assess their performance on, let's say, um, a monthly basis, right? I don't know what they do. Uh, I know Derek worked with uh, such platforms. I don't know if there were, there were things that were being done, interesting things. Uh, I don't know if you can comment there. Yeah, Doc, so basically I think the methods that are used to assess the performance, like you said, they'll look at the, what is called the core abandonment rate. Those are just some of the KPIs that they use. You call the call center, for example, for Airtel, at what rate are the calls being abandoned? And also the core completion rates. I'm an agent, I answer the calls. So they'll look at the core handling time. What, how many minutes, how many yeah. Interesting stuff. Uh, what you notice here, I think what Derek is saying is mostly um, meta information. And it turns out that this is um, something that's common in the telecom sector, right? Uh, the same approach, I believe, is used to analyze core detailed records. What you're analyzing is the descriptive information about the calls, not the actual content. But, but my interest in all of this would be, can we? try and take advantage of the actual content. Now, I'm not talking about the, the calls that people make here. I'm talking about the content uh, for, for entities like the call center, for instance. Can we analyze those calls and be able to pick out uh, interesting, interesting things, like the common themes, for instance? Anyway, speech to text, um, it's, it's, it's a well understood problem here. Um, something I've, I've, I've been trying to work towards here is automatic content, automatic content generation, just because um, uh, what I've noticed is in Zambia especially is that we, we, we somewhat have a problem when it comes to creation of content. And I like using Wikipedia as an example. If you look at most of these uh, popular Wikipedia pages, if you look at UNSA, the UNSA page, for instance, you notice that uh, it's, it's pretty much incomplete, right? It can be better. Um, there are very few people that update content there, but, but the thing is, can we, can we automatically generate some of the content so that the people that edit such pages only come and verify the content and just make minor modifications, right? Um, maybe we can, we can create textbooks, right? Automatically generate textbooks, for instance. Um, so something I've been trying to, it's just that I haven't had time to do this, but something I've been trying to do is uh, for some of the courses that I've been teaching for the last three years now, like this first year course I was talking about where we have a pro project to do with uh, identifying at-risk students. The argument is, uh, can we maybe quickly create a book, right? Where sure, we take advantage of cr crowdsourcing, but taking a completely different angle where we create these scaffolds, right? To do with the content. It's possible, it's been done elsewhere. Uh, all you have to do is uh, just look up uh, uh, automatic, automatic generation of content. In fact, these days, right, people have come up with uh, sophisticated techniques that, that make it relatively hard uh, um, for people to, to tell whether it's, it's actually an estimate or an algorithm that actually created content. I know there's a, there's a project that's to do with uh, uh, is it an MIT project, uh, automatic paper writing or something, authoring? I don't know if it is. Yep, can sense writing, yeah, Saijin. So you probably want to look up Saijin. Uh, it's a two code uh, Saijin they came up with. <laughs> what these people did, right, is they, they came up with, uh, they came up with um, um, a way, right? A technique of, uh, automatically writing an academic piece of paper, right? They even have a tool. So you just feed it fictitious names here, right? So we can, we can say it's authored by Martin Sonda and Derek Wally or something. Uh, 
uh, and then we can automatically generate this, right? It automatically generates a pip, and I, I don't know if there's an, another link that, uh, uh, send anyway. It automatically generates a paper, and what these people did to test this is they successfully, sorry, I submitted it twice, I wanted the link to the software. They successfully submitted it to, to a venue where the pep, some of the papers were actually accepted. This thing is not working. Um, so interesting things there, right? Interesting things happening. Uh, automatic content generation. I don't, I don't know if uh, this is uh, making sense. Uh, so, you know, I'll pause after I talk about this. Um, there's a, a colleague, uh, someone I've known for quite some time now, who um, um, they, he's a medical doctor by profession, but he's trying to specialize to become a radiologist. Um, and so it's quite funny actually when he sits down and he tells you what they do there. I find it funny because I understand computing, right? Um, the funny part is that they manually analyze the imagery that are generated by the different machines that they have at UTH. Now that, you have to think here for, for a second, that is a huge problem. It is a huge problem because the last time I checked, when I was talking to him, I was told that uh, uh, I was told that medical uh, journal of Zambia. But I was told that uh, UTH has less than five. Zambia actually less than five, or is it less than ten? Professional radiologists, not a radiographer, right? These are people that uh, will graduate from entities like Evelyn Home, but a radiologist, a person who is trained to interpret. MIRs, those chest x-rays, because your, your, your doctor, the normal general practitioner, cannot interpret that x-ray, which is why if you go to a hospital like UTH, or in fact even these private hospitals like uh, Coptic, um, if, if you have an ailment that requires uh, an x-ray, once you get that x-ray, you are directed to another profession, a radiologist, right? If you read this paper, it's an interesting paper, very easy to read. Um, if you look at this abstract here, I don't know if you can see this, there's a critical shortage of radiologists in Zambia with only five saving the entire population of 17 million. Now, this is a problem, right? You and me, um, you and me um, are fortunate, right? We are, we are the lucky few in Zambia that have resources, money, uh, uh, depending dep whether we can sit here and argue what, how we will define that money, but I think it's money even if you're getting health insurance from your organization, right? Which I'd like to think it's all of you in here. You and me are fortunate because when we get sick, we know that we have access to these professionals. It's not the case for people that are in remote areas. And I had a, an interesting conversation with, uh, with Ernest, he's going to give a talk soon. Um, recently, when he was telling me that uh, he discovered, he has discovered that uh, uh, it appears as though these remote areas have certain people that apparently interpret these x-rays. But the normal thing that's supposed to be done is when you take an x-ray an X-ray in a location where you don't have a radiologist, you're supposed, you're supposed to send it to a professional so that it's interpreted properly, right? So a lot of, a lot of uh, serious problems here. And I like throwing these problems because um, it turns out that most professionals, right, people like uh, yourselves and me, for instance, will tend to gravitate more towards problems that have the potential to generate money. Working in this area will not generate any money for you, unfortunately, right? Um, so, but the, pro the, the thing is, can we come up with solutions, data mining or machine-centric solutions that can address some of these problems? And the answer is yes. Yes, because we know that it's been done elsewhere. All we'd have to do is just appropriate these solutions to our context, right? Um, and in the case of machine learning and data mining in this particular area, we just need to compile a lot of data, right? And label that data. It turns out that one of the problems here would be labeling of the data, essentially, or finding people to accurately label this data, right? So interesting things going on here. I'm just gonna pause here and find out if uh, people have any thoughts so far about what we've spoken about uh, 
questions maybe and maybe this this idea of uh, <laughs> of uh, certain areas that who lack specialists, right, to work in them because th there are simply no incentives. The only incentive to work in this space but for somebody like me as an academic is recognition, right? Um, I'll be honest with you, I mean, it's, that's what drives me here, uh, to, to this particular space, right, recognition. Um, but to a certain extent, I mean, I, I, I've come to a stage where I sometimes understand and acknowledge the fact that I, I'm privileged and so when I do have the opportunity, um, as is the case when I'm working on an environment like the UNSA, I try to carve out problems in such a way that I can, I can try and address some of these things going on, right? I don't know. But uh, so, so last year we did an exercise. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have time to do this this year. When, when, I was, when we were doing introductions, I, last year I took note of where people were working, um, and, and I, I threw in some ideas at them, right? We had a, a very productive conversation about this. I think we had people from ZRIA and uh, Parliament. I was especially interested in Parliament because uh, we had two people from Parliament, and I was telling them to say, I've been fortunate because I, I, went, I went with uh, a group from Uzad go and uh, present to some uh, committee there. Um, and the first thing I noticed, it's very strange in life what you notice depending on what your background is. The first thing I noticed was the, the infrastructure they have in place. They record everything that goes on there. They have so-called parliament TV I discovered, right? The question to ask is, what are we doing by way of trying to make sense out of these discussions that go on in parliament? Are we doing enough? Or are we, are we simply just broadcasting them live and then we forget about them? It turns out there could be important information that is being discussed in Parliament, right? Information that should probably um, trickle down to the masses, people like you and me. I don't know. Um, I talk more about targets because when I'm cycling or driving around, I pass through targets. I always rant about how if you visited other places, and I know most of the people in the room have visited these other places out there, you don't hire a human being to man a target so that they get money from you and give you back a receipt. You don't do that. It's counterproductive, you're just wasting resources. Right, it's pointless actually. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things it turns out that we can do um, to work in that area. Now I know some of these um, things we're talking about are a bit political here. Oh, but where are the jobs going to go? Well, Let's train these people that are manning booths to do things that are more productive, right? I don't know. Maybe train them in, in machine learning so that they, 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 they create solutions that are going to be used by such, um, such infrastructure or something. Um, some other things I'm going to talk about here is, um, I like discussing Facebook. Everybody is on Facebook, <laughs> right? I have examples here that I'll talk about, but, but it turns out that you can do uh, sentiment analysis on things like comments, for instance, right? try and make sense of uh, the perception that people would have about a certain topic. Right? Uh, people have done crazy things like uh, trying to use uh, information from uh, social media platforms like Twitter, for instance, to try and predict election results. Now, I know something like that would probably not be that effective in Zambia because we know that the vast majority of the voters are in remote areas where they probably don't have access to social media platforms, right? Um, but we can still do sentiment analysis and apply it to different areas or sectors of society, right? Um, so we, we can do interesting things like opinion mining from social media, for instance. Um, maybe also, I don't know about you, but I've got into a stage where if I look at an entity like uh, WhatsApp, for instance, in my case, uh, I struggle, right? I str I've actually muted some of these, uh, some, <laughs> some of these, um, some of these uh, WhatsApp groups because I just cannot keep up with, with the information coming from there, right? I'll give you an example of this thing here that has, I now have 925 unread messages, right? Now the thing for me is this, this group here will normally have information that I want. The question is, can we, right, automatically classify things that are being posted by people, which is that we can, right? Probably one of the simplest thing we can do. Maybe we can do some, we can use a, 
one of the past um, MS, MSC WhatsApp group as an example to try and see how we can do a bit of text classification. That would be interesting. Right. Um, but what if we can we can we can work with um, with information that's being generated in print media, right? Uh, I've been toying around with this example, and I should show you this. Um, uh, so I have access to, uh, I have a subscription of Zambia Daily Mail here. Uh, I hope I'll be able to find it here. Okay. Uh, I hope I'll be able to find it, maybe not, I don't know. Okay. Uh, Um, I have access to uh, stuff that is printed by um, Zambia Daily Mail, and I collect it religiously. This is a high resolution, um, and I think those of you that have electronic subscriptions, Zambia Daily Mail, will, will know that this is happening here. But these are high resolution um, images, uh, sorry, high resolution documents. And so the, the thinking here is that, uh, I can just uh, find what I'm looking for here. The thinking here is, uh, can we? Probably not here, actually. Okay, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, the, the question is, and I think this is an example, maybe. The question is, can we, there we go. So can we, can we automatically mine data from here? A newspaper has uh, a predefined structure for the most part, right? You have headers, you have titles, you can extract important information here and actually be able to make sense out of what's happening. Um, immediate benefit of doing this is perhaps you can automatically extract uh, adverts, right? And, and instead of selling the entire newspaper for was daily mail, I would instead sell the ads to people that don't have uh, money to spend, uh, how much is the paper these days? I, I've forgotten what my subscription is. Uh, I thought there was a price somewhere on top here. But you can have, um, is it 10 quarts, I, I wonder? How much is the newspaper these days? I don't know. But, but maybe you can, you can extract information here. You can, actually, right? Um, and, and maybe be able to pick out interesting patterns from these newspapers. Imagine what we could do is if we could go back in time, gain access to the post newspaper, and see if there's a historical trend that we can apply currently, right? Um, the potential is limitless here. I don't know if uh, people have thoughts so far or questions. Uh, I think we've been talking for almost one hour. I thought maybe we'd. Uh, <coughs> um, yeah. All right. Um, has, has anyone ever thought about harvesting data from some of these platforms I was talking about, like Facebook, for instance, sentiment analysis? Has anyone ever thought about uh, going to a place like, um, like Facebook and try to make sense out of what goes on there? I've been working with, uh, uh, I was working with a group of uh, students here. Um, I don't know if this is Facebook Crow or something. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if... Uh, <clears throat> so what, uh, we were having fun with this data, right? And uh, we were having fun with this data with them and uh, And one of the things we did is I was, we were doing an analysis of, uh, is it db dot, is it this, okay, fine. Were, oh. mm, I've forgotten how to access, uh, could it be that this thing doesn't have a uh, show DBs? Maybe it's this. Maybe that thing doesn't have a, a db dot. I don't know if it doesn't have the data or something. I'm probably using uh, this thing wrong here. Uh, 
maybe it's just the video find. No? No. Anyone remember the, uh, I don't know if my, my databases have been, uh, uh, have been deleted or something. Uh, I mean, the data in my database is, is gone now, I suppose, I don't know. It's supposed to, maybe it's in here, I don't know. I'm looking at the size, it's supposed to be in here because this, this has nothing clearly, it's zero, but uh, this should have something, db dot, uh, uh, maybe I should just show. Okay, so db dot, <coughs> we post the collection here. All right, so, uh, so one of the things we're doing is that we're doing an analysis, right? How, which of the posts, right, were most popular um, at the time we were extracting this, right? So we found out some really interesting things, and out of these posts, obviously, <laughs> some of the things we did was we, we narrowed down on the top posts and then we were trying to analyze the comments, right? Uh, so comments associated with these specific stories, right? Interesting, uh, interesting things that we, we discovered here. Uh, I think one of the popular posts here was to do with uh, that uh, lady, is it Miss Gondwe who stole from, is it uh, Barclays Bank or something, right? So it, it attracted the most reactions but the thing is, right, and I talk about this in sentiment analysis, if you look at a post like uh, one coming in from Zambia on Watchdog, for instance, here, what you will notice is that for the average person, I, I don't know about you, right, but if I look at a post like, uh, like this, I don't know what this is about here, but it's most recent, I look at the one that has uh, 1.6 thousand, 1.6k comments here. If you look at a post like this, right? Uh, who, who in here, right? I, I don't know about you, but I don't have the time to read through all of these 1.6 million comments. There's a lot of comments here. I mean, you'd have to have nothing better to do in life for you to read through all the comments, or maybe on a weekend and, I don't know, drinking or something, and you have a bit of time, you'd be reading through all these comments. But it turns out that the vast majority of these comments are probably just jokes, people talking about something that's completely unrelated to this. Can we? Can we harvest this data, including the reactions here, which are again 1.6, uh, 1.6K here. Can we harvest all this information and be able to make sense out of what's happening? Opinion mining. This is what I was talking about when I was discussing opinion mining here. Um, um, I mean, at, at some stage once we discuss uh, clustering, you realize that uh, even if you didn't know what the data was about, you can cluster it so that you try and identify patterns that exist in the data. Right. <clears throat> um, it turns out, right, we can sit here and continue discussing, and, and there are a lot of examples, right? I don't know how many of you use uh, Smart Compose. Uh, you've probably noticed that when you're writing on Android now, there's a, a text that's automatically detected, right? the things you write, right, are collected somewhere. Um, and, and there's an estimator on algorithm behind the scenes that is automatically able to predict what you're going to write next, depending on the word that comes before, right? A classic application of uh, deep learning there. Um, right, so, um, so there's a lot, there's a lot we can, we can, we can, we can, we can do here by way of exploring data mining. Um, and I always like discussing or further contextualizing um, the endless uh, spectrum of problems we can work in or work on by trying to distinguish curiosity-driven research and uh, uh, impact-driven research, right? Um, none of them is better than one, uh, but I, I always try to remind us that uh, there are these two areas that you can choose to work in. Uh, it's, it's quite common for computer scientists or people with a computing background to work on curiosity-driven problems. So problems that won't necessarily have a direct impact on society, perhaps. And it's like puzzles, for instance. You have people that are obsessing about, uh, can we devise a machine that is able to beat uh, the grandmaster in chess or something? I mean, if you sit down and think about it, right? Um, how does that 
positively impact a society like Zambia, right? Curiosity-driven research. They're trying to push the boundaries of research, trying to do something that has never been done before. On the other hand, you can choose to work on a problem that's going to affect society, right? I'm just talking about uh, sentiment analysis here. We're talking about targets here, right? The beauty with impact-driven uh, research is that um, you, you tend to, to take advantage of solutions that already exist, right? Some, some people with a technical background might find this boring. Uh, it so happens that I think uh, the seven or is it eight years I spent in, in graduate school, I was indoctrinated because I spent a lot of time with people that obsessed a lot about how we can take advantage of technology to try and improve society, right? So to work on developmental problems. Uh, so poverty alleviation, for instance, improving learning outcomes, right? And it's okay if you gravitate more towards curiosity-driven research rather than impact-driven research. But I just wanted to remind us that uh, if you look at a place like Zambia, most of these problems that we have uh, are more impact-driven in nature, right? Um, classic examples that exist in these mainstream sectors uh, or domains like education and health and just society in general um, are going to be presented. I thought I would start with, uh, <laughs> I would start with this pronouncement in 2019. It would be nice to find out from the ministry here how far they've gone, right? The, the, the Minister of Information and Broadcasting went on radio, I guess, clearly here, saying that uh, government wanted help with monitoring content that was being transmitted from radio and TV stations. Now, I know what you're thinking, right? Censorship, and it's true. But I always, my argument with these sort of problems is always my role as a person who is technically inclined is, is, is not to, to, to police and, and to try and uh, figure out how people are going to use a solution that I come up with, right? Um, for the most part, I leave the decision making to people that are paid or that are trained to do that. I don't, I'm not trained to do that. I'm not qualified to do that. Uh, I'm not employed to do that, right? I don't make decisions. So it turns out that this, right? This you can, you can easily work towards, right? You can mine this data. It's sound. Well, if you look at TV here, there's a, uh, it's video, right? Video is nothing more than a continuous stream, right? Of uh, images. This can be done. Now, it's common in Zambia that uh, we will outsource, right? Maybe China came up with a solution, who knows? But, but, but here we are, interacting and training people that would be in a far much better position to do this, right? You understand the environment and you can, you can work on these problems. There's nothing complex about this. Um, I don't know if there's someone from ZRA, I, I saw a, a lot of new faces here. I like this example. I use it a lot in my first year class because I teach a computer systems and architecture course. Um, in 2019, ZRA was ranting about how they're experimenting with uh, drones to try and identify truck drivers who are trying to default on paying tax, right? Uh, it turns out that these people have probably identified back roads that they use to, to try and uh, uh, avoid uh, tax here, ta tax avoidance, because the case of tax, tax, uh, tax avoidance. But the question is, can we do interesting things with the drone footage that is captured? I don't know. I don't know what this way, I mean, what uh, ZRA is doing with this data, right? Drone footage. Don't know where they're storing this information, what sort of analysis they're doing, but I'll bet you it's, it's probably some superficial analysis, right? Maybe you need human intervention for you to analyze what's happening. And same goes for things like, uh, you've noticed how most places now have CCTV cameras here. <laughs> I'm sure they only analyze those things when something wrong happens or when something wrong is reported. Um, one of my siblings went to Pakra. Uh, I always tell him that he's stupid, really. He went to Pakra and he was moving around with uh, a cash, right? That was, uh, is it two years ago? He had 30,000 cash. Uh, so he runs an uh, animal health consultancy. He's a vet by profession. Um, so he, he went to Pakra and left the bag which had money in there. And so fortunately, Pakra had CCTV footage. Of course, the quality was bad here. Um, but the only time they were able to visit that footage was when he reported the crime. Suffice to say that uh, the perpetrator or the perpetrators were never caught anyway. Key thing here, can we automatically detect things that are potentially happening? 
right? If you are a large supermarket, for instance, maybe you can take advantage of a solution that automatically detects certain things, right? That footage that you capture regularly. Who knows, maybe you'll be able to identify people that are stealing candy in stores or something or swapping barcode, barcodes on products, right? Now, I thought, uh, because we're talking about footage here, I thought I would include this. I was on Sunday, I cycled along Great East Road, I went to Cassisi well, for the first time. I cycle a lot, it's one of my hobbies. I did 80 on this day. And I thought, I always have a, a, a footage of um, top plazas, right? But this time around, I found something that I see, but I, I haven't had a chance to capture footage of, right? So I cycled past this. These are cameras, and there are a lot of them in Osaka, if you've noticed. They're in so many different places. It so happens that uh, what you're seeing here is located close to a tall plaza. I think I was about 100 meters away from the tall plaza. You probably can't see here. Um, but the question to ask is, what are we capturing? How are we capturing this information? And what exactly are we doing to make sense out of this information as a country, right? Can we uh, make better use of these facilities so that uh, we can perhaps uh, uh, identify certain interesting things, you know, be able to automatically figure out how much money we are making on these tall, tall plazas, right? Now, I'm not trying to say people that work in those tall plazas are dishonest, but maybe we can try and match the money that is reported as having been made on the top plaza with what is being captured by these things here. Yeah? Who knows? I don't know. And so 100 meters uh, close to a top plaza, you get to see a lot of interesting things here, right? And, and if you think about it, there's a lot of interesting information that we can mine here. Um, those of you that have driven, and I think it's almost everyone in the room, those of you that have driven or when we drive through these top plazas, what you notice is that your license plate is automatically detected, right? So there's a bit of OCR that, that is already in place there. But the question is, what are we doing with this information, right? What are we doing with this information? Can we do interesting things, right? Now, this is controversial, but can we get rid of those people so that we save money? I think we can. Uh, I've been to places myself where we're driving through a tall plaza and there's no one. There's nothing like uh, you need a human being there. For what? It makes no sense for you to hire someone to give you a receipt, right? It makes zero sense. In fact, uh, I don't know if this has happened in Zambia yet. Um, there are certain places where you go in a supermarket. You do not need um, a person at the till to scan things for you. Uh, anyways. Um, I don't know if people have any thoughts about uh, employment here, right? <laughs> um, I don't know if people are, are curious that we're talking about uh, getting rid of certain jobs. Very, very soon, there'll be no need for people like Lighton uh, teaching, right? Maybe the role I'll say would be different, right? Perhaps we won't need teachers. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Just like we won't need drivers very, very soon, right? Uh, any, any random thoughts here? Is there something that you've uh, identified or has anyone worked in this area? Maybe you know what, what happens by way of uh, how this data is analyzed. No comments. A any random thoughts so far or none? Um, can I say something? Yeah, please, please feel free actually. I want you to say something. Maybe just to pick from what we see in the movies. <laughs> um, they normally use a lot of CCTV TV cameras whenever they are looking for criminals, yeah. facial recognition, yeah. are trying to track uh, a person's movement, uh, which roads did they use, things like that. Yeah. yeah I mean, this is, this is something that perhaps we can... We can do right in Zambia, but it, it's um, the unfortunate part, right? And, and I see it as unfortunate really is that if you look at how the education sector is structured in Zambia, the people that are trained to do the things we are going to be doing now are people that are already um, at an advantage in society, right? You are managers, most of you. Um, you already have uh, uh, a lot going on for yourself. 
it's unlikely, unfortunately, and this is the reality we are faced with here, it's unlikely that uh, there could be some of you that will probably venture out in, in such spaces and try and uh, propose solutions and hopefully make money, right? Startups and side projects and whatnot. But um, because of how the education sector is structured in Zambia, most people that will come and do uh, these advanced degrees like masters and PhDs, masters especially, um, are people that, uh, that are already uh, in, um, in, uh, in, in these um, situations that, that won't really incentivize them or encourage them to, to do the dirty work that you'd need to do for you to propose solutions in this space. But, but the, the potential here is limitless, right? And which is why I always try to invite people from industry especially so that they come and talk about the problems that they have. So that even if you don't want to work on, on impact driven research, perhaps you can focus on a, on, on an area that will make you money. Banking sector, I have a friend of mine who works for the central bank, and he has told me, even the central bank has not yet got into a stage, balls, the whole lot of balls, they have not yet got into a stage where they take advantage of machine learning. That is virgin territory right there, right? Um, so I thought that sound was from the chat, but it's I think from WhatsApp because I'd opened my WhatsApp window and just close this. You know, so something to think about here, the CCTV part is an interesting area, right? <laughs> now, I don't know if the government is, uh, if they're investing money in this space, I'm sure they have solutions, ready tailored solutions, um, which do interesting things. I wouldn't be surprised myself. Uh, the last time I tried to invite someone from uh, the Zambia Police Service, uh, it was very disappointing. I was told, no, you need to first of all write to the Inspector General. I'm thinking, just inviting somebody to come and give a talk. Come on. In fact, we're seeing this as a stage where we identify potential areas of collaboration. Right? We don't like what we see, right? Where you go to a police post. I visited a police post in Katete not too long ago. They have this uh, textbook that they bought from some, some stationary shop, right? where they write, they record these, uh, these police cases. A while back, I went to Marshland's police post, right? In modern area like Lusaka. They had this huge book where they are writing cases. Are we really analyzing those cases? I don't know. Are we recording them? If we are recording them, do we have the backlog of data that we can mine and make sense out of? I don't know, right? Um, sadly, I doubt if there's anyone there's very few people that will come out of a space like this, right? Postgraduate student who say, I'm going to work on it on this project once I'm done. <laughs> once I'm done. Unless if you are working for an entity that does that and you are, you are you find an, that area exciting. The best we can do, what we try to do is to take advantage of the projects that you do in the second year. So we cut them out in such a way that you work on um, an area or a problem that has a potential. To, um, to improve society, if we did not have um, people like uh, Lillian, people like uh, Francis Chulu, I don't think we'd have people working on such obscure problems, like you're trying to detect four amulets, you know, incentives. Anyway, I don't know. Uh, so I guess it's a philosophical problem. Um, and I'm sure there are smart people out there that are trained to analyze such problems that will be able to propose effective approaches for doing this. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Yes. Just sorry, I raised my hand, but you were, I think you were oh. not checking. Yeah, yes, I think just, just, just to add on to your thoughts. Yeah, I think one, uh, I do agree with you. Where, you know, you go to a police station, all the cases are recorded manually, so there's no history to show that Derek committed a crime in such and such a And this, I was convicted yeah. by the courts of law. Yeah. Now, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us as a country to move forward and whatever we learn to apply them. Now, the problem comes in, I come and do the MSc. Yeah. The knowledge and all everything that I get out of here, applicability now becomes a problem. I go back to my employer. 
My employer, what they're interested in, they're interested in, first of all, they're not interested in research. Yeah. Companies now, they're talking about cost. Every organization you go to is cost. When you go into the private sector, the private sector doesn't, it's not going to uh, budget for any project that is just research based. They want you to go and implement a solution that will give them a benefit in that very year or the next year that comes. So yes, basically we get these concepts, we learn all the new trends in the industry, but lack of, uh, if we come to government, there's no political will. Government has got a lot of, yeah, a lot of students have passed through your hands. If we had political will, where government could even fund research in the universities, the public universities, for example. There's a certain component of research whereby when you come up with these theories, you come up with certain things, can you now put, uh, put them into a, can you put them into practice? Can you develop solutions that solve the real world problems? I think that's where we, 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 we find, we have got a lot of learned people, I've got PhD orders, we've got master's orders, but what is it that they are doing to change society for the better? Yeah. I think those are the things that we, we tend to struggle with in this country. There is no budget for research, in short. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. You, you, you raised a number of important issues, and I, I wanted to start by, uh, I understand this, this notion that uh, most of these companies we we'll, we'll tend to focus more on the return on investment, right? Uh, not really interested so much in research, but it turns out, right? That uh, there's, there's things we can do with industry um, by way of developing solutions. And, and I always extend a handout to uh, colleagues that I've worked with, uh, people that have enrolled in this course, for instance. Every year I extend a handout to say, I have free labor available if you have even a small project that you're working on at work that involves maybe data mining or machine learning or something that you're planning to do but you don't have the manpower to do, I'm more than happy to co-supervise a project with you so that we develop a solution that you can use. The beauty with that is that uh, it's fourth year, right? Unless if it's sensitive data, but if it's not sensitive data, it's fourth years, most of these fourth years, and you know this because you are fourth years as well, they're able to, to develop solutions, right? Solutions that you can maybe refine further and then deploy them. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say, I mean, there, there are things that um, uh, we, we are about to start embarking upon with uh, entities like CIDAS, for instance. And I guess CIDAS is, is a bit different from entities like Zanako because they do a bit of research also. So, so they're slightly more receptive um, when it comes to working with people from academia. But it's possible, this we can do. Um, so it starts from right here, right? especially for people, most people in here are holding managerial positions. Uh, it starts with you just trying to propose some project in your department. You don't necessarily have to have people actively working on that project, but you can collaborate with entities like the UNSA. It's not always the case that UNSA will uh, request that you pay money for a certain service, right? We are here to provide a service. It's part of, uh, it can be carved out as being community engagement, by the way. Uh, and, and I think there are people in here that went through UNS or maybe other institutions where you worked on a fourth year project where you were attached with some place elsewhere. So this is possible. Maybe it's something we can think about. Um, and I like bringing this up because this is a theme that has come up um, uh, even when, when, when you're looking at ICTAS, for instance. The issue they always say, our association, is that the, the link between academia and industry is almost non-existent. Um, and, and this is something I think about. It's something that I've been, in the few years that I've been at UNSA, something that I've been trying to see if I can push towards, right? Try and see if we can identify people we can collaborate with in industry. It's doable, I think, in my opinion. Uh, maybe we can work on some more um, <laughs> curiosity-driven research or research or problems that will uh, make money for your respective companies, you know? Uh, Maybe something else to do here is, uh, as we are thinking about things that you are going to do in phase number two, which is next year, um, think about a problem closer to home, at work, right? And then try and see if you can, yes, you'll be conducting a research project, 
but maybe a byproduct would be a solution that can be deployed at your workplace. It turns out that it, sometimes it's, all it takes is you to show people that something is feasible, right? You demonstrate that something can be done and then there'll be a bit of buying perhaps from them. Um, but anyway, uh, it's dental. It's part of the reason why I, I, I like uh, lecture number two, I like contextualizing things like that is to throw all these things at you. These are potential problems. Uh, some of these you can take them up if you want to. Machine translation, language translation, uh, sentiment analysis, right? Th these are things that you can easily properly package and carve out as, as problem for phase number two, right? Some of them will probably inspire you to identify problems linked to what you do uh, on a daily basis at work, perhaps. Uh, so when it comes to Facebook, by the way, um, again, I was talking about sentiment analysis is exactly what I was pointing at, right? I don't have time to check how many likes and dislikes there were here. <laughs> How many comments, what, what were the, these comments about, right? But you can categorize these comments, right? Short text topics, for instance. There are people that are, have written papers about uh, trying to come up top, with topics using short text, like SMS messages. Can you cluster them into topics? Turns out it's a hard problem. Can you do sentiment analysis to find out what are people's perceptions with regards to this post that was posted by Zambian watchdog on the 6th of March to say Monze to Namala Road? Can we, can we summarize the perception that people have? Is it positive? Is it negative? All right? Using the, the comments and perhaps the reactions here. Before you can do that, before you can do sentiment analysis, you need to mine that data. Um, Anyway, I mean, we, we can sit here and talk about, uh, about data mining all day long. In fact, we can discuss things uh, forever, right? Because people are doing a lot of crazy things out there. I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that the one thing in common in all of these things that we've just discussed is a key ingredient that you need for you to mine data, and that's data, right? Before you can apply these techniques that we're going to learn about, you need to make sure that you have data in place. In certain instances, that data needs to be cleaned, it needs to be organized in a certain way, it needs to be transformed into a form that the estimators will be able to understand. Right, so we'll soon see exactly how we do this. How do we convert text? How do we transform text into a form that um, these algorithms or estimators uh, expect, right? Um, so it turns out that there are certain web, web embeddings that we get to use for us to transmit, uh, to transform text to a form that um, a computer will understand. It's typically in numbers. All right, so we'll look at uh, TFIDF, uh, things like um, term frequencies or bag of words, models, and all the fancy things. I'm not sure if you get to do this in um, soft computing, uh, but there are certain web embeddings that are specific to techniques uh, to do with uh, deep learning. Um, uh, things like way to vec, for instance. Um, if we learn one technique, it's usually a lot easier for you to figure out another technique, right? So uh, if we have time, we'll probably look at those things. Um, so things like how do we convert an image into a form that a computer will be able to understand? Pixels, right? Those are just nothing more than numbers. We, if we remember this from computer architecture or computer systems, for instance, right? Sound, you can convert this into numbers. Right? It's not that hard because we know that as, as you are transmitting sound from analog to digital, there's a conversion that takes place there, right? Converting it into, um, I guess, uh, a digital format that can be translated into numbers as well. Uh, the same goes for video, right? Video can be perceived as being nothing more than a series of images. In fact, it is a series of images, right? Presented to you in rapid succession and provides an illusion that, that there's, it's motion picture, you know? Um, so there's, there's a lot here, um, uh, and I wanted to mention here, there's a caveat here, because of my background, because of my obsession, um, a huge chunk of the examples we are going to use are going to involve text, but we will see if we can incorporate some aspects of these other types of data. But it turns out that it's not that hard to work with, with these other forms of data. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're working with text, video, or sound, the approaches are somewhat similar. The t techniques you use might be different, but the idea is the same. You need to first of all collect the data, you harvest, uh, you prepare the data, you transform it, 
um, and then you you identify the appropriate estimators, right? And, and we'll see these different phases when you, we discuss the CRISP-DM model. Um, I hope it's is it next week or after next week, maybe lecture series number four, I think, I don't know. Uh, so data is key here. All right, so just to remind us that in terms of 5741, for us to be able to do all these interesting things we're mentioning here, uh, in essence, we, what we'll be doing is working towards these broad objectives. So formally speaking, uh, the goal of 5741 is to work, to work towards this. And we mentioned this, I, I think, in the first lecture series here. So I'm going to go through a process where we try and identify the key processes associated with data mining. Um, and traditionally, we've adopted the crit dm model, but we get to, to uh, talk about or discuss these other data mining models that exist. Um, and then be able to, uh, the, other, the other objective is to be able to describe the basic principles and algorithms used in practical data mining uh, problems and understand the different strengths and weaknesses. Um, we should also, or we are also going to be working towards applying data mining techniques to solve problems in other disciplines, right? Uh, in a mathematical way. Uh, so it could be maybe um, in the social sciences, right? Sentiment analysis, right? Maybe it could be in the education sector, which is uh, another obsession of mine. Um, uh, but, but, but the idea is we are applying these computing techniques in a mathematical way, right? And, and we evaluate these techniques, these solutions we come up with um, uh, empirically so that we're able to assess their efficacy, the effectiveness, and in certain instances, the efficiency also. Um, we should be able to apply the different data mining methods methodologies with information uh, uh, systems and generate results that can be immediately used for decision making. So you develop a system that is able to do sentiment analysis. And, and number one question to ask is, how accurate is it? How effective is it? It's a machine, yes, you come up with an algorithm, but to what extent are we able to trust this? You come up with, with uh, a model that is able to predict at risk students. How do we know that we can trust this so that it's used for decision making? evaluation. Uh, and if there's one key takeaway point that I'm going to emphasize when we're doing this, something that sets us apart from someone who is just a, a self-taught programmer is this aspect of evaluation. Extremely important. And in fact, extremely important in more sensitive domains like the health sector. Sure, if you misorganize someone uh, to a solution that is predicting at-risk students in education, the, the, the risk are not really that bad, but imagine a situation where you're using um, uh, an estimator that is predicting whether someone has cancer or not, and then the solution says the person doesn't have cancer. You've misdiagnosed that person, right? The implications there are much, much more serious. Someone could die, right? So we'll look at evaluation. Uh, we'll look at different evaluation techniques. Really, really interesting. Um, and, and really, it turns out that uh, Collectively, these are the things we are supposed to work towards in this course, right? So uh, broad overview of data mining and data processing, data warehousing, I hope we get to do this this time around. We always prioritize the techniques, the machine learning techniques. Uh, classification, things like associative, uh, associative room mining, uh, clustering techniques that we can take advantage of to make sense of uh, data um, that we know nothing about. So we're interested in discovering patterns that exist in data. Um, all right, so in terms of the specific themes here, we, we, we typically break up 57 foot one into broad themes. We start out by looking at uh, data mining in general and data preprocessing. Uh, so we get to understand the different phases uh, in the data mining pipeline, the typical data mining pipeline, the process we, we go through when we're trying to um, discover knowledge in data, right? And uh, it turns out that uh, different, the, broadly speaking, you, you, you can take a statistical approach or a more traditional data mining approach. So we, we get to discuss the variation. Um, we'll look at various machine learning techniques, uh, pattern recognition techniques. We spend a lot of try, time trying to understand how we collect data, how we clean up the data, we pre-process it, how we transform it before we can feed it into the estimators we're going to use, right? Um, we also do a bit of pattern evaluation here. And then there's supposed to be a discussion uh, on data warehousing where we look at uh, decision support systems, 
um, get our warehousing architectures that are available out there, uh, things like online transaction processing. Now I'm gonna pause here and try and ask if there's a, there are courses we did at undergrad that discussed uh, data warehousing. I know when I was a student myself, I did an advanced database technologies course where we discussed data warehousing, right? Uh, so these things like star schemas, snowflake schemas, fact tables, and dimension tables, I don't know. Uh, do we still remember this from undergrad? I know for some of us, maybe it was many, 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 many years ago. In my case, I did this in, I think I did the advanced data, I could be wrong here, but I did it in, was it fourth year or third year? It was a long time ago, 2005, it was when I was in third year. Uh, so it's been a while here. Uh, Oh, 16 years, I guess, I don't know. But so, uh, so we get to look at data warehousing. Um, maybe it will be a revision for most of us, which is why we don't normally prioritize this, but we'll try and focus on this. Uh, we'll try and see if we can look at this uh, this time around. Uh, it's mostly going to be revision anyway. Um, and, and then we get to look at uh, specific types of machine learning techniques, right? And if you look at um, machine learning, there's Usually it's clustered into supervised machine learning, semi-supervised and unsupervised, right? Classification falls under supervised machine learning. We also have uh, things like regression, right? Uh, we'll look at all these different things. Um, associative rule mining. Um, we also look at uh, uh, techniques that we take advantage of when we are um, leveraging unsupervised machine learning, right? so cluster analysis. Uh, now, there are a number of approaches that are used here. We tend to focus more on the more traditional approaches like k-means clustering and hierarchical clustering, for instance, right? Usually because we don't normally uh, have time here, but we'll try and see if we can strike a compromise, um, try and see if we can cover as much as we can. But the idea is pretty much the same, right? Um, and the beauty with most of these things, by the way, is that th there's, there's very little you have to do because most, most of the estimators, for instance, already exist. Uh, and the goal of this course is not for us to learn how to implement uh, things like TFIDF or how to implement uh, uh, an estimator like, uh, or to, how to, to implement uh, k-means clustering. I mean, we could do this, it's simple by the way. You can mimic how it's, it's done, but, but our focus is not to do this. It's just to try and understand how how it works, right? Uh, now, for this part, uh, I just wanted to, the part to do with the description of what we're going to do here. Uh, I like reminding us that uh, there should be life beyond 57, 57, 41, not 57, 10, yeah, sorry. Um, and what I mean here is that we should think beyond uh, life after UNSA, right? how can we take advantage of some of these things we are learning and be able to apply them in industry, for instance? Startups, side projects, uh, pet projects at work. Uh, maybe we can form groups, and I've been saying this for the last two, maybe three years now, I've been trying to, COVID has messed up a lot of things, trying to tell people that one of the things I'm thinking of doing is to come up with uh, some sort of a group, right? Where we can, we can, when we have free time, we get to share ideas and maybe work on problems that are specific to Zambia and suggest solutions for free. Can be done. No one is doing sentiment analysis. All it would take is just one week. A one weekend, not one week actually. A weekend with, with a group such as this one, where we work on a specific problem. It can be done. It's not that hard, right? And I also always want to remind us that uh, what we do at UNSA fits into a bigger picture, right? So what we're doing in this course fits into the program as a whole, by the way, this MSc program you're doing. That MSc program fits into uh, UNSA's goals, right? Currently, those are uh, mostly informed by the strategic, uh, UNSA strategic plan. Uh, the current one runs from, um, if you're not aware, it's from 2018 all the way up to 2022. Uh, it's going to be revised. I do encourage you to go through this. It's always nice to, to be able to put things uh, into perspective here. 
Uh, so, oh. Oh my God, I don't know how long I've been uh, talking to myself here. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Confused here. Sorry, I think I was confused here. I thought I, I had lost connection. <laughs> I think I had another instance of Chrome. I didn't lose connection, did I? I don't know if I lost connection or not. No, you didn't lose. No, you yeah. didn't lose connection. Sorry, I got confused here. I think this is what happens when you talk for, this is why, if you remember, last week I was saying we, we have to break this thing up into manageable chunks, right? You can't have a, a lecture for three hours. Or let alone for two hours, it's not, which is why we're leveraging this. So I had another instance of um, Chrome, and there was um, there was um, there was a Google Meet open, and so I thought I had lost connection. Sorry. Um, so anyway, uh, so I, I just shared. I was about to share the uh, the uh, Unza strategic plan. You probably want to skim through that so that you know what Unza is working towards. There's always a method to the madness. Uh, a lot of people, when they talk about UNSA, I find it funny, right? They think that, uh, they think that there's, there's nothing going on at UNSA. They have no idea. I had no idea when I was a student myself. Um, uh, I consider myself lucky that I work with uh, very smart people, right? Smart people that are doing um, amazing things. But anyway, um, so there's also Vision 2030. Um, I don't know if people are aware of Vision 2030, right? Uh, I like talking about Vision 2030 because uh, we are aspiring, apparently, to be uh, an information, a knowledge and information-based society by 2030, apparently, right? Um, so you probably want to look into Zambia's Vision 2030 if you don't have access, if you're not aware of this uh, already. Um, I don't know if people are aware of Zambia's Vision 2030, or you've read through this. No? I don't know if I can just find uh, uh, If you haven't, you don't have to read the entire entire document. It's, it's quite the document, I, I assure you. It's always nice, though. There's no harm in reading it. But you probably want to focus more on the part where we talk about, uh, uh, if I can just find, we talk about um, things to do with ICT. Right, and specifically, I think it's, if I search for graph, this is what I wanted. No, I wanted the one from Ministry of National Development, right? Yeah, there we go. If you haven't, you probably want to skim through this. Uh, it's an interesting document. It gives you an idea of how the National Development Plans uh, fits into the bigger picture here, why we are doing certain things in the country. And I think for us, my thinking, my thinking has always been we, we need to we need to seriously think about uh, contextualizing. I think this is it. Yeah. So you find Vision 2030 there. We need to think about contextualizing um, what we do, right? Problems we are addressing, uh, what we are teaching, um, so that it's aligned with with uh, with what we are striving to to do as a country. Um, Anyway, so just uh, something else I wanted to say here in closing to do 741 here is uh, um, this idea that uh, please make sure that, I know it's, it can be hard, try and attempt, as, uh, try and ensure that you attend as many sessions as possible, right? Especially when we have invited speakers, there's some interesting things that will come up um, uh, and attempt all the assessments. It can be hard, but when you start early on, usually we have about a week uh, you're given a week to work through things like paper reading, uh, paper readings, so that you summarize them. Uh, don't wait until the day before, because what you submit won't really be, it, it won't, it won't get you good marks. Uh, and let's avoid uh, any form of academic dishonesty. Listen, I, I wanted to find out if there are any questions before we get to the next part. Maybe.
people have thoughts so far? No. All right. Um, as I'm thinking we can finish off even part, if we can, look at the time here. I think we can finish off even part three and part four actually. Uh, so, okay. So I just wanted to chat more about some, some academic, uh, I thought, was this academic? I think we're starting with paper readings anyway, not academic activities, let's see. Yeah, we're well, starting with the, then I talk about academic things. So these are jumbled, sorry. So we start, uh, these are jumbled, part, this is supposed to be part four, this is supposed to be part three. Um, so the reason we have a dedicated session where we, we discuss how to read a paper is, uh, it, it turns out that uh, uh, maybe when we're doing our undergraduate uh, projects, I guess, in, in undergrad, but when we're doing our BSc, our bachelor's, probably very little focus was, was spent on the research component of what, we're, what you are working towards. Um, so the reason we have this uh, discussion about papers, summarizing papers, is so that we, we know what to do when we are working on the assignment or the assessment that's uh, uh, loosely aligned with uh, paper readings and summaries, right? Um, so uh, my advice is uh, you probably want to, as you're summarizing these papers, you probably want to devise a technique that works best for you. Um, and a good starting point, right, is uh, you want to you want to see if you can pick up a bibliographic manager that you will find comfortable using. There are a lot of them out there. Uh, I like using Mendel. I like citing Mendel as an example because I've been using this for years. But there are also tools like uh, uh, Zotero, for instance, uh, tools like Jabref. Um, so this will help you organize the things that you're reading. So in the case of Mendeley, for instance, um, by the way, Mendeley is available uh, online. Mendeley Desktop is called. I don't know if people are aware of Mendeley Desktop here. It turns out to be a quite a useful tool. In fact, as you are writing as well, it automatically generates, uh, it automatically generates uh, uh, references for you. So when you're writing your proposal and when you start writing your dissertation, you'll find it tremendously useful, right? Uh, and I think I should close some of these, uh, I think I should close some of these Chrome windows there. They're disturbing. So you probably want to maybe just try and down, download and uh, and look up Mendeley Desktop, yeah. And just see, right, but there's also Zotero, Zotero. Zotero. So all of these are Zotero, not Zotero. This, all of these are so-called bibliographic managers, right? Um, and what you can do is you can actually bibliograph, bibliography managers. You can go to Wikipedia and just check for a list or comparison of uh, bibliographic managers. They're also called reference management software tools. Um, I've used both Zotero and, um, I've used Zotero, Mendeley, uh, and Jabref. Uh, I, I recommend Mendeley myself. I've not used Zotero in a while, so I'm not really sure how far it's, it's gone here. But if you look at this comparison here, you have quite, quite, quite the list here, right? Uh, uh, I think when I was a graduate student, there was RefWorks. Yes, it's, it's, uh, my, my alma mater had a paid su subscription for RefWorks, so I used RefWorks as well. Uh, but you want to look, look up that. The way this works, right? If you have a paper reading, for instance, um, and, and let's say you're reading a paper like, um, like this. The beauty with Mendeley is that as you are reading, so the traditional approach is when you're reading an academic paper, most people have a book or they'll print out the paper and you start notating the paper, right? You start marking or taking note of important points. Well, you can do that electronically with a tool like Mendeley. So you can highlight, for instance, right? You highlight and then you can, uh, you can add notes, right? Right, so you, you're commenting different parts of the paper, maybe the abstract, you've taken note of something important about the abstract. Um, and the beauty with that is you synchronize it with, you synchronize all these changes to the cloud. So as you're creating your, Men, your, Mendeley, your Mendeley account, um, 
you you actually get to synchronize everything to uh, to your your cloud uh, your cloud uh, your cloud your, your, your cloud uh, the cloud platform. So you have the cloud account essentially. Um, very very useful, right? Uh, I guess I should have used. You know, I wanted to showcase how it works, but I think I need to. I needed to log into my personal account. It's much easier that way. Uh, so, 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 yeah. So the bibliographic manager will synchronize the notes, right? That you're taking note of, but also as you are reading, maybe you identify related papers linked to the to the paper, right? That you are reading. You might want to download it. So you, you organize things in a more logical manner, right? Uh, like I have right now. You notice that if I, if I was to count the number of things I have, I have 926 documents. The reason I have this many is I, I, everything I have compiled um, since I embarked my journey in academia, uh, since my master's anyway, I've been collecting and I organize them accordingly, right? So literature associated with my PhD, literature associated with my master's, literature associated with things that I, I have authored, for instance, uh, projects that I'm working on, right? Um, but, but what you find useful in terms of the paper, reading, uh, uh, paper readings is the fact that you can annotate these things, highlight and write notes, and be able to synchronize the notes to your cloud account, your cloud-based account. Um, the other thing is at some stage, maybe you might want to join certain groups there are so-called Mendeley groups. So you notice here, I'm logged onto my account. I have access to my library. So uh, this is a desktop-based application, but I synchronize everything to the cloud so that when I'm using a different computer, I still have access to this information, essentially. Uh, you might want to look into this. Uh, you will find it useful. So you're not only synchronizing the papers, but the notes as well. All right. Um, and then something else you will want to do is uh, to be able to figure out exactly where you find uh, certain resources or papers as you are as you are reading up, right, on papers that are are, are going to be um, uh, a part of the assessments to do with paper readings. When you are looking for related work, you will want to focus more on uh, certain specific academic databases. The obvious one is Google Scholar, obviously. Um, because it, 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 it actually uh, crawls through even gray literature, right? So reports will be found here. Um, very useful resource. It will actually also be useful when, when you get to a stage where you, you work towards that other assessment where you're supposed to suggest the paper yourself. So I do encourage you to do this. And perhaps now would actually be a good time for you to, to create a Google Scholar account as well. Right, um, you want to create a Google Scholar profile so that uh, with time, um, so that it's actually a lot easier for you to, to search for things because it turns out that there's certain features here like your library where you can bookmark certain interesting papers, right, within Google Scholar itself. Uh, so you want to go to just scholar.google.com if you, you haven't gotten here before, but I, I know maybe most of you uh, have probably done this uh, already. Uh, if not, maybe you've been introduced to this in, in the other courses that you've already started doing. There are certain things that are probably going to be the same, right? The, the way I do things is probably going to be similar to the way Sam or Jackson or Mayumbu does things. Uh, that's fine. Um, it turns out that there are certain specific uh, portals that will, um, uh, will act as academic databases for specific fields. A minor, for instance, is specific to computer science. Uh, so within within A minor, so if you go to A minor.org, what you discover is that uh, subfields of computer science are clustered there. So you will find uh, data mining, I guess, somewhere, right? If you notice here, uh, the beauty with A minor, I like the fact that they rank these things, right? So publication venues will be ranked. So publication venues to do with databases and data mining, for instance. You notice here that. Uh, the World Wide Web Conference is highly ranked, right, according to A minor. You can also do this in Google Scholar. So if you go to Google Scholar and you, you just go to a uh, profile, you just go to Google Scholar and then click on, click on metrics. 
Uh, when you click on metrics, you can go to categories, and then you go to engineering and computer science, and then you visit the subcategories of computer science. You notice that we should have uh, data mining. I'll be surprised if it's not here. Where is D? Uh, data mining and analysis. And then you can, you can actually rank. Uh, you, you see here that CKDD is highly ranked according to Google Scholar, right? Um, so you can, you can also do this in Google Scholar if you want, right? These metrics uh, will, will point to the fact that they'll, they'll give you a relative indication of, of how important a particular venue is. Uh, and in fact, on that note, it turns out that uh, if you find some very strange publication venue, some journal or something, and you want to find out um, uh, how good it is, uh, ranking, how good it is, what you can do is you can just key in the venue. So Sykesit, for instance, the South African conference. I hope it's here. Nope. Oof. Um, let's see if we can find anything to do with South Africa, maybe Zambia or something. Right, so you notice that uh, you can look up a particular publication venue, right? Maybe Medical Journal of Zambia. No, MJZ probably is here. Ah, there we go. So if you look up um, a journal like uh, Medical Journal of Zambia, it gives you certain metrics, certain important metrics, right? Like the H H5 index, um, which, which tells you the relative importance uh, of that venue. Now, your H index score, this is a metric that is also specific to, to uh, specific authors, so if you go to Jackson's H index, for instance, what this thing does is it tells you that Jackson has authored at least 11 publications that have at least 11 citations. It's, it's essentially a metric that um, gives you a, a, relative, a relative quality of things that have been published either by the individual, in the case of Jackson, or by a publication venue. Right, so it's not enough for you to say, oh, well, I've authored things and I have 351 citations. But how many of those things you've authored are perceived to be of value by other researchers? Because other researchers will cite you, they will cite you, uh, we are academic myself, I'm not like Jackson, I only have an issue index of five, but they will cite you if what you are doing is perceived to be important. Right. But I think you discuss all of these things in the research methodology course anyway. I just wanted to point out that as you are searching for literature, you want to be, you want to pay particular attention to some of these metrics. Uh, and also, you also want to be on the lookout for so-called predatory journals, right? Um, I don't know if you've heard of Bell's List. Uh, so people have compiled, uh, they've compiled uh, a list of publication venues that uh, have, have traits associated with predatory journals. So, so th these are just publication spaces that are there to just make money, right? Maybe they're not even peer reviewed, right? So um, avoid predatory journals. Um, there are a number of such, uh, such uh, curated lists. Uh, you just have to search and look for them. This will be important for the assignment where you're suggesting a paper, uh, because obviously marks will be deducted if you suggest a paper from a predatory journal, right? We don't know if, if that paper is perceived to be important by other people. Usually, a normal academic publication venue will have a rigorous peer review process. You have an odd number of reviewers, three, maybe five. People that will endorse the fact that that piece of writing is worth to be published, right? Anyway, so more on uh, curated lists, um, you will find this uh, interesting compilation by Jeff Wang. Uh, he does this religiously. So best papers in computer science in different subfields of computer science. You will notice that there's probably data mining somewhere here, I guess. Uh, I don't know. Uh, KDD, I don't know if KDD is here somewhere. SIG, I guess uh, it's clipped somewhere here. The, well, KDD is here, I don't know if you can see KDD here. There's also CIGIR, so Special Interest Group in Information Retrieval. There's a lot of um, machine learning stuff that is done here. Uh, but 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 from a, from a perspective of information retrieval, 
This is where you find uh, uh, people that work for these large entities like Bing and, uh, and uh, Google, for instance, uh, submit papers, interesting papers, actually. Uh, if you're interested in curiosity-driven research, you want to Google up a special interest group in information retrieval or SIG IR. Um, uh, SIG IR. Uh, I'm going to program committee this, this year. It was last year as well. Um, you want to look this thing up. Uh, there's usually a lot of interesting tech-oriented stuff here. Very technical papers. Um, uh, that website will give you a window to 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 where the proceedings are. Uh, in fact, you can you can actually say Sigaya ICM Digital Library, and and you should be able to to get to um, to the part of the SM Digital Library where you have uh, proceedings that have been authored in the past, right? With very nice statistics here, like. Uh, uh, Wait a minute, is this, let's say, Sigaya Proceedings. Um, if I were you, I'd be on the lookout for things like uh, best papers, uh, interesting stuff here. Uh, um, there's, there's usually, the, the interesting thing about academia is uh, <laughs> you can't run out of things to read, right? So many things being done, right? What you want to do is to be very careful what you read. And that is key. You want to be very careful that you're, it's, it's like when you're buying food, right? You want to be very careful that you're buying high quality food. Yeah, I know, I'm also tired myself. But, but you, you, want, <laughs> you want to be very careful about this. Um, closer to home, we have, uh, I don't know if people have heard of the ICT journal. Has anyone read content from here or submitted papers from the ICT journal? No one. Has anyone heard of the ICT journal? We have some interesting, if you are looking for content, that is all. Am I the only one who's uh, lost the dog? Hi, class. Hi, hi, Dave. Hi, Dave. Yeah, I, I can't also hear the dog. So if, I was thinking maybe it was me who's, who's lost connection. All right, I know. I think it's the book. Okay, yeah, he, has, he has just posted in the group. He says you joined uh, shortly. He has lost connection. Oh, yeah. Yes. I thought it was only me. <clears throat> okay. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that, I lost my connection. Now, I, uh, is it some, a year ago, maybe two years ago, no, a year ago, I think, I, uh, I decided to, I've always used the uh, ThinkPads, right, for laptops, but when, when I was, uh, when I was uh, attending some event somewhere, I was in, in South Africa actually, I, I couldn't find a ThinkPad, and the closest I could find was this, it's called a Lenovo IdeaPad 320. Horrible machine. Please avoid, avoid it. Uh, do not, <laughs> do not, uh, do not make a mistake of buying that, like, it's horrible, right? Um, very horrible machine. 
I was hoodwinked, I guess, but it's fine also. Um, so I was I was talking about uh, <clears throat> sorry about the interruption. There, I was talking about uh, publication venues, and I was about to mention uh, pu the publication venue closer to home. Uh, so the Zambia ICT Journal, ICT Journal, ICT Journal. Uh, is it dot? Is it dot? Uh, I don't know if it's dot org. Oh, anyway, we'll just move up ICT Journal, Zambia ICT Journal. Uh, so, Mungushi University, um, uh, UNSA, and CPU have come together. Uh, of course, at the forefront is uh, ICTAS, and uh, uh, yeah, so they've uh, they've come up with this journal here. I, I do encourage you to please find time and uh, just crawl through here. Right to to see what we do in Zambia, what sort of focus we have in Zambia. I assure you, there are a lot of interesting researchers in Zambia that both in the industry and in academia that are doing certain interesting things. I, I bumped into George from CBU, and he does a lot of uh, speech speech recognition. Some really uh, interesting things here. Right, there the, the are colleagues that focus more on. Uh, IS, information systems, uh, so you want to go there. Uh, but, but, but just a note that uh, when you visit the Zambia ICT Journal, what you find is you also find uh, uh, not just computer science content, but stuff that comes from information science, uh, library science, uh, uh, IT, information technology, because we have realized that we don't have a lot of people that are able to publish in more focused venues. So we could decide to say we're going to come up with a venue that is to do with computer science. But the question is how many people are going to publish there, right? We're already struggling as is, right? If you look at uh, the amount of content we have in this journal here, very few, right? For each issue, we have very few. Um, so please find time and look up these other venues. Um, always nice to look at the problems people are addressing. Any thoughts about uh, the Zambia ICT journal? Has anybody read something from there that they thought was interesting? Or not? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the paper to do with four amyworms, if you want, if you have time, I do encourage to amyworms. It's in here. There's one in here. Or is it not in here? True, Francis. Maybe I'm, yeah, I'm not spelling unknown properly. So you'll find the, the, the paper about uh, the four unknown things I was talking about. Interest, interesting paper on four unknowns. I don't know if four unknowns is one word. Some say it's one word, but I don't know. Uh, it's interesting stuff here. I mean, it's uh, if you have the time, I do encourage you to start spending time on some of these spaces, right? Um, very interesting stuff here. Anyway, uh, all right. So I, I thought. Uh, so the the question to ask is when you are reading a paper, to summarize a paper. Uh, what what exactly should you focus more on, right? Um, I always, uh, sorry, I'm gonna pause just to find out if people are still with me here. I don't know if you can still hear me or see my screen. We're here. Okay, yeah. It's, all, it's okay to sleep these days. You never know if, um, I, there's a course I teach and uh, we've decided to, <laughs> it's a funny course, right? Uh, not really funny course, but I thought it was funny last year because out of, uh, the, the attendance was uh, less than 10% last year. And, and I raised this issue with my colleagues, and I told them that this year I'm incorporating um, uh, marks into attendance. Right? This time around, you won't believe it. It's almost 80, 90% attendance. And, I, and we try to tell these undergraduates for their own goods. Different when you're a postgrad, right? You know what you're doing. You can easily do certain things on your own. But when you're an undergrad, no, no, no. Um, so, anyway. It's okay to sleep, uh, and I'm sure the other undergrad will probably just log in and just uh, maybe mute 
and, and do something else. And, but anyway, so, so the question is, how do you summarize a paper? How do you read a technical paper, right? You're given a paper as an assignment, right? You summarize it using, uh, in, is it half a page? What do you focus more? Uh, I would like to suggest uh, some, some papers on how to read a paper, <laughs> and I know, right? So I guess you can make a problem. Um, I like Kishav's paper, right, on how to read a paper. It's specific to computer science. All of these are specific to computer science, but I like using Kishav's approach because it's a, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a pretty uh, intuitive method to follow. And once you read uh, one, two, maybe three papers using this method, it will become second nature for you to do these things, right? So you'll be able to do the correct things. But what you'll notice as you are reviewing these papers is that they have a certain predefined structure. Okay? So a typical computer science paper, a technical oriented computer science paper, will have a title, of course, an abstract which will highlight the problem that was addressed. In some instances, the motivation behind why they worked towards that problem, the approach that was taken, uh, the results that were collected. So uh, for computer science, actually, besides the approach that was taken is maybe the intervention or the solution um, that was proposed, the results that were attained, right? Perhaps by way of using the solution, maybe the prototype or something. Um, the conclusion, all of that, all, all of those things are crammed into 200, anywhere between 200 words to 500 words, right? They form your abstract. Um, and then you have an introduction, right? Where you have things like uh, the actual specific research problems, the objective of that research, um, maybe the background information associated with, with, with the problem that was being addressed. And then of course you have uh, a literature review or related way where the authors will, will identify or, or highlight gaps in existing literature. Things that sets apart what was done in the paper from what was already done. But because in essence, you publish, you, you, you're, only, you're, only, you're only supposed to publish something that's new, right? If you're writing peer reviewed uh, uh, paper, it, it has to be no, novel in some, in some sense, right? It, it, you have to bring something new onto the table. There has to be some sort of novel contribution um, in trying to expand the boundaries of science or something, right? Uh, and so the way that you contextualize all of that is you, you highlight related way. You say the differences between what was done here is ABCD. We are doing this differently by doing ABCD, right? Um, for computer science papers, it's, it's almost always the case that you have a description of the solution that was implemented. So if you are building a tool, you describe how it was built, right? If you are implementing a machine learning model, as is the case with data mining type uh, problems, you would explain the model implementation process. Um, and then the evaluation, right? Because when you build something, you need to tell us how good it was. You evaluate it. Was it effective or was it more efficient? Um, and there are really different, different ways of, um, of measuring evaluation. You just have to identify the appropriate metric to use, right? Uh, a metric that's linked to a specific evaluation aspect. It turns out for data mining, um, we focus on two things, efficiency and effectiveness, right? So efficiency is to do with computing resources, and then the effectiveness is to do with how good uh, a model, for instance, is. How accurate is it? So you develop a solution uh, by way of a model that is able to identify at-risk students. The question is, how accurate is it at, uh, at, uh, at predicting an at-risk student? Is it 90% accurate? Is it 95% accurate, right? You build something that is able to detect uh, uh, that it's just x-ray, um, somebody, somebody has tuberculosis, for instance. To what extent is it accurate at doing that, right? Um, so we discuss all of these things. You know. So you'll find an evaluation, um, section. You also find a section that discusses, it reports the results and discusses the results. Sometimes you have a separate results section, sometimes you have results and discussion, um, where you combine the results and the discussion. And then you have a conclusion, and of course, uh, references also, right? References that are cited in the paper. 
So everything cited in the paper will be listed in the references section. Um, in essence, right, we're gonna uh, uh, just take advantage of uh, something that uh, we published recently, and in fact, this is going to be a test paper, by the way. We're trying to take advantage of, uh, and, uh, oh wow. We're trying to take advantage of something that we're familiar with. Uh, Right, so if you look at uh, something like this, right? Uh, abstract. If we can just uh, abstract. Introduction. Related way. Now you can have sub sub subsections or sub subsections if you want in your paper. That's fine, um, and you'll find that in our case here. If we scroll down, we should have a uh, oh, well, methodology, which is your approach. Uh, there is number four. Uh, evaluation. Uh, results and discussion. So this is combined into two. Uh, and then you should have a conclusion somewhere at the end, right? Usually sometimes people say conclusion on future work, right? Like we did here. We are also explaining some potential uh, things that can be done to extend this work uh, or things that you're currently working towards, which is what we did here. Now, now, something else I wanted to mention here is that sometimes, right, a paper won't be structured explicitly using this traditional structure. But, but in essence, you will find aspects of what you're supposed to find in these sections embedded somewhere, right? Uh, and sometimes the order is not, um, is not exactly as it is this way, but traditionally, this is the order you follow. You have a title, abstract introduction, related work, sometimes called literature review, or existing work, or background. And then you have a uh, uh, methodology, uh, proposed approach, or implementation. We didn't have a, a, a methodology. Evaluation, uh, results, discussion, conclusion, and then the references, right? So the references would be, I forgot to cite them here. The references would be here, right? Um, and, and of course, everything that appears in the references has to be cited up above. So, so this general structure that you'll find in all these papers you're going to be reading. I'm using Kishav's approach, right? It's called a three-pass process. Um, very useful when you're getting started, when you're trying to remind yourself how to read a peer-reviewed paper. Different from um, a paper in, in, in mainstream media or maybe in, in a newspaper, for instance, it's supposed to be done differently. So Kishav proposes um, a three-pass process where uh, you first of all, in the first pass, you just read the title, the abstract, and the introduction. You read this thoroughly. And then you just uh, read the titles of the sections and the subsections. Read the conclusion and then look at the references. Usually the first pass shouldn't take you any more than 30 minutes. If you're doing this for the first time, not more than an hour. But the key outcomes here is that you'll be able to classify what type of paper it is. Is it a theoretical computer science paper? Is it an implementation paper? Is it an evaluation paper? Just all the computer science papers are classified in a certain way. You'll be able to contextualize it um, within a bigger picture. Right? Maybe you'd have already read something that is related to that paper. In the first pass, you should also be able to ascertain whether the paper is correct. Are there some methodolo methodolo methodological errors, for instance? Are there errors to do with the formulas, right? Are you able to identify the key contributions that these authors have made? Was the paper clear enough? Almost all papers or computer science papers will have an explicit statement outlining what the main contribution was. Usually this is in the, uh, in the introduction. Almost always the case, right? What are you bringing to the table? You must tell them, right? Um, anyway, um, so that's the first pass. And then you go through the second pass where um, you, 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 you take a, a deep dive here where you, you take note of some key things here, right? Where you analyze the different figures and tables and graphs and try and see. Are these graphs, these things that are being presented in the paper, do they make sense? So graphs like these, for instance, do these make sense? 
do these do these help support what is being discussed in the paper, right? Are you able to clearly interpret what is being presented here? Maybe there are errors here, right? There are usually errors in graphs. All of these things here. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, and then the, the outcome here, though, this is key here. By the time we are going through the, se the second part, you should have a firm understanding of the paper. It's really the case that you get to the third pass, uh, but if you do, uh, I, I get there myself when I'm reading a very obscure paper, maybe a field I'm not very familiar with, um, especially when I'm reviewing papers, right? Uh, for the venue, uh, uh, I, I'll sometimes have to read that paper, maybe more than three times, actually. Uh, so you'll be able to identify some key outcomes, you'll be able to identify some potential flaws with maybe the experimental design, or the methodology, for instance, or the way the results were being analyzed and interpreted. Um, by the time you get to the third pass, you should be able to reproduce the paper, right? Now, now here's the thing about uh, how to read a paper, right? Uh, oh, and I have it in Mendeley. Because it's such an important thing, I, I have added it in Mendeley. There's a lot of uh, stuff here, is how to read a paper, how to read a, uh, a computer science paper. I think Kisha, I should just search for Kisha, I guess, I don't know. Is it this? I think so. Right, so it's, it's a short paper, right? And I know how to, you have, you're going to have to read a paper on how to read a paper. So it explains this, um, this three, three pass approach in depth. I do encourage you to just quickly read through this because it turns out that we'll do a, a, a quick trial uh, where you're just going to have to read a paper and then we can have a discussion about it next week or something so that we prepare ourselves for what's happening next. I don't know if there are any thoughts so far. Uh, and, and I know we're pushing our life. This is 20 hours. Uh, we're almost there. The last part is just going to be a quick one. I just wanted to pause to find out if people have any specific questions uh, or concerns that they might have. Okay, just checking to see if people are still there. All right, that's okay. Yeah, uh, we're still there. Okay, thanks. So um, the one that we are just showing us, the, it was the name again? Uh, it's called uh, How to Read a Paper. Uh, in fact, what I will do is I will I'll post, um, it's by S. Kisha. Uh, I will post, um, let me just post the link. So it will be in the notes, okay. Kisha. Let me show you how how um, how how it's perceived, right? By other people, how important or how important this thing is. Now you know, right? I mean, it's thinking. Well, it's been cited 118 times, right? 223 versions there. So, how to read a paper? And uh, I'll point you to the actual original PDF here. Uh, I guess I'll just point you to how to read a paper. I've just pasted it in the chat. There's a DOI that's been tested there. Something else is uh, you want to look at is how to read a computer science paper. There's someone from some Canadian university, I think. Uh, was it was this Kisha or something? How to, it's called how to read a CS paper, I think. Where is that from? I remember using it. There should be something. There we go. Uh, this is somewhat helping. It will probably help complement. Um, it will help complement um, uh, the Tishav's three-pass process as well. Uh, most of the things that are mentioned in here are pretty much similar to what you're going to find elsewhere. Uh, how to read a CS paper. And there are some of these things, right? This, this will come back when you're writing a proposal next year. When and I think you start writing the proposal towards the end of this year, actually. Uh, when you start writing your dissertation, hopefully next year, towards the end of next year, or maybe early after next year. Um, uh, it's, it's usually nice that you get used to this process early on, in, early on rather than later. Uh, it's part of the reason why we've incorporated paper readings in the, in the course. I don't know if you have paper readings in the other courses also. I've never really bothered to find out the structure uh, or how people have structured the courses. 
Do you, which course is Mr. Is Sam teaching you? Chuta, Dr. Chuta. Which course is he taking you in? Advanced Web Technologies. Okay, uh, what's the assessment criteria in there? Are there your paper readings there or seminars as well, or it's different? I think we have, from what you said, we have. Okay, yeah. So it's, it's, there's some, there's going to be some common common things here. But the beauty of life, right? And I think you've seen this in your workplaces, where the uh, uh, the behavior of people, the way people do things, their work ethic and culture, is usually it's it's usually associated with maybe where they went to school, right? Uh, the interesting thing about a place like Unza is the people that you're working together with, right? Went to different schools. So if you look at the CS department, I, I mean, Mayumbo is an exception. Both Mayumbo and myself went to the same school, right? And interesting enough, both Mayumbo and myself were supervised by the same person at masters, although he did his PhD from Japan. So what you'll find is that the way that the teaching is going to be different, and that's good, I guess, I don't know, uh, in my opinion. So in terms of academic activities at UNS, I'm just going to cruise through this because I've already started sharing or spamming the mailing list with those things. I feel it's important that you at least attempt to be a part of these public talks, especially things like uh, exams in the CS department. These are public events. When, when the, there's a, a Viva Voz, an oral exam, an invitation is extended to everyone, to the general public. Because whether we like it or not, we're going to have to do the same thing. I always advise that you attend these, uh, these events. It's actually becoming a lot easier now because of COVID-19, because these events are held online. Now there would be an excuse, uh, there would have been an excuse maybe two years ago to say, maybe I'm busy at work and I won't be able to drive all the way to Unza to attend the River Voice. But this time around, because these are online events, all you have to do is just make time. There's always something to be learned. Uh, I've picked up on a number of interesting methodologies myself that I've applied in the research uh, I conduct when I attended talks in other disciplines or domains. Um, uh, I've attended uh, events in agri or in education, and I'm able to identify to say, oh, that problem can be addressed by a computer science solution easily. You know, so I do encourage you to do this, especially that you're at some stage, you're going to have to uh, identify problems yourselves. Um, you know, so a lot of a lot of such events, colloquiums, uh, PhD uh, defenses, uh, things like uh, masters or exams, uh, all of these are interesting events to attend. I mean, after all, you are paying money to, to be a part of this. You are paying money to gain access to these support structures, by the way. You might as well attend them, I would if I were you. Um, I know that DRGS has been decentralized. In the past, we've had uh, a so-called postgraduate seminar week where you have postgraduate students from, from the whole lot of UNSA meet in one space, and, and then they give uh, presentations. They present posters associated with the sort of work that they're doing to draw inspiration and to, to, to have a sense of what you're going to be doing, it's always advisable to attend this event. It's been, it, so DRGS has been decentralized. I'm sure there will be uh, individual events for each school. So you want to be on the lookout for these events. Um, and make sure you at least attend an event this year, even if it's online. Um, right, and so uh, what we are getting started with next uh, week is, uh, um, I always um, insist that we, we get our hands dirty from the, from, the, from the outset because a number of people are not very familiar with uh, the technology stack that will be used here. So there'll be a gentle introduction to some of the common tools we'll be using. Uh, so Python, Jupyter Notebook, uh, specific Python libraries that we'll be using. Um, we'll look at exactly how we install specific Python packages. Um, and then I would like for us to have a, uh, just a trial, a paper reading. Uh, so what I would like to suggest is uh, is that um, as a trial, I will send out an email with details of the of the paper. Um, and I wanted to I wanted to do two things next week, and I'm not sure if if maybe this would be a productive way of, of using our time. 
But because we will start inviting people to give talks, I also wanted to give a trial of what you should expect in talks. Uh, and I would give the talk myself. Maybe we'll ask this, and maybe not. But we certainly need to do a trial for the paper reading because beginning after next week, we'll, we'll start sending out uh, assessments to do with paper readings. Uh, so I'll send out uh, details of this trial reading. But this trial reading is going to be based on this paper, by the way. I guess a, a chance for us to have more people read what we did, right? Uh, so I'll send out, and it's, it's a journal publication. Usually uh, a typical conference <laughs> proceedings paper in computer science is limited to 10 pages. But it's 17 pages. Uh, it's, it's an easy to follow paper. If you don't understand things, that's fine. Uh, the idea is uh, uh, this is meant to help you understand Kishab's three past process. So we can have a mild discussion about this next week. Um, and then I'll send out detail. Maybe we can also, do, we'll try and see if we can do an academic talk, but we'll, we'll dive straight into uh, getting started with uh, Python, Jupyter Notebooks, and all these different fancy libraries. Uh, so we'll do this next week. Uh, all right. So I wanted to find out, and by the way, these are the links uh, for, to the paper, how to read a CS paper and how to read a paper towards the end. I, I just wanted to find out if people have any specific questions. I, I know we are tired, right? Three hours is a long time. But um, <laughs> I, I wanted to find out if people have any specific concerns or questions related to what we just did. or complaints maybe. I'm open to suggestions if you think uh, at some stage if, if, if our approach to do multiple activities for each three hour session or two hour long session is going to be too much, what we can do is we can try and alternate certain things, right? Uh, so, so say try and uh, remove certain activities or something. But the idea of having multiple activities is to try and break the monotony, right? You can't have uh, a lecture that's three hours in duration. Uh, it's not a very productive way of use, using time. People tend to lose focus uh, quickly, in my opinion. Uh, all right, so if there are no questions, then I guess, uh, uh, and by the way, the, the Astria site is not yet, uh, it's not yet up and running. Um, I've reached out to the postgraduate coordinator but the moment it's up and running, we will move everything to Austria. But for now, uh, I will continue sending these links to the recordings, for instance, if, if, if ever want to play back these recordings via the mailing list as links. And then when the Austria site is up and running, we'll properly organize the site. All right, so I suppose I will see you next Monday. In case of anything, we don't have to wait until Monday. We can continue exchanging uh, things via the mailing list. Any thoughts? Good evening, Doc. Yeah, my, my evening, hi, Miss Mambo. Good. Uh, I'm new to this lesson. I just joined today. Yes. So I'm pretty sure you might not have my email and I heard you say you're going to mail the links which you yes. just talked about. So okay, how so, do we share our mouse? Yes, I think there's a defect or is there a, I think, I don't see him now. Honest Peer is supposed to be, uh, I don't know if he's a course, but I, he sent me a list of emails to add to the meetings. But for now, I've just pasted, uh, I've just pasted my uh, details in the chat. I don't know if you can see that, my email address. So it's light on the yes, so Yeah, so it's just send me, uh, if, if you don't have, uh, if you don't have, a, if you're not yet on the mailing list, just send me an email and tell me that you want to be added to the mailing list and then I'll add you to the mailing list. All right. Yeah, and I, I don't Very know much. if, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I don't know if Roy and uh, Zilani, if you joined us last week, oh, are you new as well? Uh, yes, for me actually, yeah, it's, 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 uh, this is my first class. Uh, yeah, uh, Roy? But, uh, on the mailing list, I think I'm, I'm actually there. I submitted the email to honesty. Okay, that's that's sure. Good. Yeah. Do, do you think? Uh, and I know this is a. Uh, we had a. Uh, oh, Roy. Hi. You wanted to say something? Yes, I was. I was here last week. Oh, you were here. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, my memory here. I think old age. Now, so so I know we we're trying to make use of uh, time here. I know people are probably. I'm sure there's there's a. Uh, 
attention required uh, maybe the kids you know bedtime stories and whatnot but maybe we can we can ask Azlan and uh, and and Wimba to just introduce themselves if you played back the recordings from last week you notice that we everybody introduced themselves can I ask that maybe just uh, maybe a minute each maybe you can tell us uh, if you can see the screen your full names and what you prefer to be referred to um, almost everyone refer, prefers to be called by their first name including myself so I'm light on and then your former education background, where you did your BSc from, um, and what you currently do. If you're working, where do you work, and what exactly do you do? What is your role? Uh, and perhaps what you hope to get from the course. Do you think you can, we can start with uh, Ms. Mambo, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get to Mr. Kalua. All right. Yeah. Um, as you can see, my name's uh, Mwemba Mambo. Yeah. I, I prefer to be called by Mwemba. Okay. Yes, I did my bachelor's degree at the University of Namibia. Okay. Uh, I completed in 2018. Mm. At the moment, I'm working at Business Connection. Uh, I'm a software developer, stroke customer engineer. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting stuff. Uh, what do you hope to get from 57 foot one? Aside from the fact that this is a mandatory course, right? <laughs> I don't think people have a choice here, but uh, is there anything particular you're hoping to get from you? Maybe something related to what you do at Business Connections or something? I don't know. I think I'll keep that question for another day. Okay, that's fine. And uh, just out of interest, in the, in the past we've had uh, people, in fact, every year we have people with an engineering background. Were you in the Department of Computer Science or maybe you're in engineering or... Department of Computer Science. Okay, all right. All right, uh, Mr. Yeah. Kalua, thank you very much, Ms. Mwemba. Mr. Kalua. All right, uh, my name, my full name is actually uh, Zilani Kalua. If mm -hmm. you can just call me, I think, uh, Zilani, my, my first name. Of course. Yeah, um, I, I, I did my bachelor's from uh, the Cooper Beauty University in Computer oh. Science. Okay. Yeah, I graduated in uh, 2014. Uh, currently, I'm actually working as a software developer for National Pension Scheme Authority, which is uh, NAPSA. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the last question, what I hope to get from this course, I think, uh, I say just to, to increase, I think, my, uh, to make or data processing or more relevant and also to increase my capability of how to how we can be processing data. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. All right. Sure. Thank you very much. I mean, it's uh, welcome. Thanks. Uh, this is good. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, George Mufungulwa. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, he taught he's, me. He's, 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 obsessed yeah. with, he's obsessed with speech. I think it's to do with his PhD. Uh, he's doing oh. some interesting things. I attended a his talk at the ICICT event in 2019, I thought that was really nice. Um, but good to have to have you on board. So we'll see you next uh, next week then. And then hopefully by next week, maybe we'll have a tentative shade of the presenters. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, good night. Uh, happy reading uh, when it comes to the trial paper. Thanks. Thank you.